Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a statement by Michael Matheson on the Morton Hall investigation report. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. I call Michael Matheson, Minister, about 10 minutes. Uh, President Officer, I am grateful for the opportunity to make this statement to Parliament. Yesterday, Dame Eilish Angelini's substantial report on her investigation into the events at Morton Hall was published. There is no doubt in my mind that Dame Angelini's investigation was robust, detailed and comprehensive. I am incredibly grateful to Dame Angelini for the work she and her team have put into this investigation and for the sympathy she has shown for those affected by events at Morton Hall. Families affected have already endured the pain and the grief of losing a child. For that to be revisited upon them due to the actions at Morton Hall is particularly cruel. It will take some time for all of us to digest the report in full, but already it is clear that Dame Angelini has identified what she believes are serious failings in the operational management of Morton Hall crematoria and in the oversight of Morton Hall by Edinburgh City Council. Dame Angelini talks about an inward-looking and isolated managerial approach and an absence of meaningful supervision or leadership. She describes a comprehensive and long-term failure to provide an acceptable service to some of society's most vulnerable next of kin. These comments go to the roots of the problems at Morton Hall. I note also that Dame Angelini concludes that there is an overwhelming evidence that foetal bones do survive cremation at least from 17 weeks gestation. This should put to rest once and for all the received wisdom that this is not the case. Members will be aware that currently the Infant Cremation Commission is completing its work and plans to report in the near future. In that context, I would like to set out next steps, both in relation to Morton Hall and to the rest of the country. On Morton Hall, the Dame Angelini's report makes many recommendations for the Council. The Council in Edinburgh did the right thing in commissioning this independent investigation. The Council has indicated that they will take forward the recommendations and we stand ready to provide any assistance we can to ensure that this is done swiftly. I also believe it is also important that the Council ensure that the voice of parents are heard in this work. The response to this report should be transparent, open and should involve affected parents. It is important that those who have been so badly affected by past events can have a stake in ensuring it cannot happen again. There is, of course, much for the Scottish Government to reflect on from Dame Angelini's report. In particular, I note that Dame Angelini concludes that the legislative framework governing the cremation of foetuses and infants in Scotland is peppered with gaps, ambiguity and uncertainty. This is an issue where work had already commenced and plans were in place to bring forward new primary legislation to update the law in this area. Indeed, there is already a legislative slot in the parliamentary programme for that. But it is important that we ensure that our work now captures the findings from Dame Angelini's report. As members will be aware, the Government asked Lord Bonamy to lead an independent Infant Commission Commission to look at these, these matters last year. Lord Bonamy and his Commission have worked hard over the last 12 months to review the policies and procedures in crematoria, in the funeral industry, in NHS and right across Scotland. Lord Bonamy has met affected parents and has spoken to people who work in the industry both in Scotland and elsewhere in the UK. And I know that Lord Bonamy and Dame Angelini worked closely while taking forward their respective investigations to ensure that they were able to learn from each other. 
I know that the Commission will be considering many, if not all, of the issues raised by Dame Angelini. And once Lord Bonamy has reported, we will move swiftly to set out clearly how we will respond to these. It would be premature for us to respond in detail to Dame Angelini's recommendations today before we know what Lord Bonamy will say. But I am happy to reassure members that, in broad terms, we very much support the recommendations that have been made. Lord Bonamy has advised us that he hopes to provide his report by the end of May. Before he does that, he has committed to sharing his draft report with affected parents to ensure that they have an opportunity to comment on his findings and his conclusions. We want to ensure that our next steps are owned by those they most affect. We want to ensure that affected parents have a voice in the future. Clearly, updating and improving the law is only part of the solution. We know that many parents across Scotland will continue to be affected by these events. Last year, the Scottish Government provided additional funding to two different charities which are supporting parents affected by these issues. As the First Minister announced earlier today, we have set aside an additional £100,000 this year to ensure that these organisations can continue to provide the support needed by these parents. We are ready, already in discussions with these organisations to understand how much funding they need. Officer, I am sure there are many parents who feel that they still do not have the answers they need. In the case of Morton Hall, as Dame Angelini has concluded, the tragedy is we may never know, and parents will be left with a lifetime of uncertainty. No amount of investigation will provide the answers the parents want. In other parts of Scotland, I know that some parents feel their own circumstances have not been investigated in the same thorough way as has been the case in relation to Morton Hall. As the First Minister said today, we want parents to have as best an answer as is possible for their own child. We will consider how best this can be ensured, where any potential criminal investigation are concluded and when we have the Infant Commission Commission's report. We must ensure that all affected parents receive the same level of investigation as happened for the 253 parents affected at Morton Hall. I know some parents have reiterated their call for a public, a public inquiry. I would like to reassure these parents I hear that call. We have never ruled out a public inquiry. We have always said we would reflect on that once we have received the reports from Dame Angelini and from Lord Bonamy. And that is what we will do. Sign officer, I want to reassure members that we will continue to give these issues absolute priority. We did not hesitate last year to launch a robust, independent process to learn lessons and make recommendations for the future when these issues emerged. We will not hesitate to bring forward the necessary legislation and take the necessary steps once the Commission has reported. And we will do all that we can to support affected parents through these difficult times. Thank you, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow you around 20 minutes for questions, uh, but I intend to be flexible if that is what is required. And after that, we will move on to next business. It would be helpful then if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak button now. And I call Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Minister for today's statement on this very sad and distressing issue? Because no one could have escaped the harrowing pictures yesterday of those families still trying to make sense of these tragedies and come to, come to terms with the failures of a system which is supposed to ensure their loss was met with dignity and respect it deserved. And I would want to put on record my thanks for the thoroughness of the report into Edinburgh and recognise that it has um, done an important job, but also to recognise 
those campaigners who, through their grief, have also got us to this place where these investigations have taken place. I know that many colleagues around the Chamber will have been dealing with similar cases to those in Edinburgh all over the country. And the Minister will know of my involvement both at a Scottish level but with my own constituents and families in Glasgow. I have found their stories difficult and disturbing and I fear that their hurt will never be properly resolved. But we do have a responsibility to try. So can I welcome the undertakings by the Scottish Government and the other organisations and Scottish Labour stands ready to work with them to help the process in any way that we can. It is clear that there is a consensus to do all we can to find answers for the families all over Scotland who have been tormented by this experience. I wonder if I can ask the Minister, does he accept that for too many families there has been a loss of confidence and trust because throughout this they have been misled about what has happened to their child very often more than on one occasion. That this is a matter for all of Scotland. And would the Minister not accept that should he agree to a public inquiry now, he would be able to draw together the past and the future. It would allow us to respond to need right across Scotland. And while it may produce very hard information for families to bear, it would give certainty that the truth is being established and would give confidence to those families for whom this experience has been one of being given not the truth. So would you not accept that establishing a public inquiry would respond to that scepticism that too many families have, which has been borne out of the terrible reality of what has happened to them? Um, I would ask him to reflect on that, but also to accept, nevertheless, that we would do all we can to support the Scottish Government in taking this matter forward. Minister. Um, I'm grateful to the member in terms of uh, uh, the Labour Party's response to assisting with any legislation that we can take forward in Parliament to try and address this particular issue. And I uh, uh, share her comments and views around the uh, distress uh, and pain uh, that this will uh, cause many families uh, as a result of the findings in the uh, Angelini uh, report. And if there was something I could do to ease that for them, I would be more than willing to uh, do that. Um, I, uh, our principal point was around the issue of uh, a public inquiry. Uh, and as I said in my statement, this is not something that we have ruled out and we will consider once we've got Lord Bonamy's report uh, to consider that alongside Dame Angelini's uh, report. One of the things that has uh, struck me the most uh, uh, from the publication of uh, Dame Angelini's report is the way in which there has been widespread acceptance of the thoroughness and the detail in which she has gone into this whole matter. Uh, and sadly for some of those parents, they will never get the answers that they're looking for as she has set out in her own report because of the nature of the practices that were undertaken at Morton Hall. And no further or subsequent investigation is going to be able to provide them with the answers that they are sadly uh, looking for. I do recognise that there are those parents who do feel uh, that there is still a need for a further investigation into their own personal circumstances. And that is something which I'm sympathetic to and will be giving consideration to as part of the work that we'll do after uh, Lord Bonamy. But I think it is right that we should give Lord Bonamy and his commission its place to be able to complete their detailed investigation. And once they have committed that report to the Scottish Government, for us then to consider what's the most appropriate approach that we should take in going forward to try and give those parents who feel that there are still unanswered questions, the answers that they're looking for, where they can be provided. Jackson Carlow. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Like others, Conservatives have met with many of the parents and again offer our deep support in the face of the distress, dismay and frustration they have endured, particularly in, in this last year. I too welcome the statement from the Minister, thank him for advance sight of it. And I also acknowledge the obvious desire of the Government to meet the scale and scope of the recommendations that are already emerging. And of course, we too offer our support uh, in the face of anything that the Government feels necessary to bring forward by way of legislation. Uh, Ruth Davidson called for a public inquiry a year ago. The First Minister felt that the investigations being led by Dame Elish Angelini and Lord Bonamy were the best approach to give earlier certainty. We, we disagreed with that approach, but we did understand what the First Minister was seeking to achieve. I think Dame Elish's report is deeper and more disturbing than any of us could have imagined. She herself uses the word grim. Now, given, and I echo the uh, Joanne Lamont in this, given the experience of parents at Morton Hall was shared by others across Scotland, and I think that is the characteristic of this that we've yet to fully understand, 
I do urge him now to reconsider our request repeated today for a full public inquiry. It's not something Conservatives seek often or seek lightly. I understand it may be a decision reached in the wake of Lord Bonamy's report this month, but I would ask him to appreciate that the sheer scale of this across Scotland, I think, underlines and justifies the need for a full public inquiry to give the certainty that I think all of Scotland needs. Minister. Well, can I also say I, I do welcome the uh, constructive response from the Conservatives in helping to work with us in taking forward any necessary uh, legislation. And I do also recognise the call that was made by the Conservatives and Ruth Davidson in particular about having a public inquiry uh, previously. Uh, one of the most important issues when we were considering this matter was the best way in which we could try to give answers to those parents who had questions and uncertainty. And Dame Elish Angelini's report has been able to investigate 253 individual cases in great detail, something which I'm sure the member would appreciate wouldn't happen with a public inquiry, because a public inquiry would only look at a sample of cases and use them for general purposes in reference to the public inquiry. So the approach that's been taken by Edinburgh City Council has actually allowed a much greater level of detail to begin into in those individual cases which I think is helpful in looking at this issue uh, in context. Uh, the member's right, we will consider this matter around the, uh, the possibility of a public inquiry once we have Lord Bonamy's uh, report. And the reason we will do that is because Lord Bonamy, and when the member makes reference to the issue of scale, Lord Bonamy will consider the whole process in every crematoria in Scotland. He's looked at every policy and practice, including the paperwork that's operational within our crematoria in Scotland. And once we've actually got his report, we'll then have a clearer understanding of the scale of the matter in Scotland. And at that point, we'll then be in a better position to make an informed decision about whether a public inquiry will actually add any extra value to what's already been carried out by Lord Bonamy and Dame Eilish Angelini. Jamidi, followed by Neil Findlay. Uh, thank you, uh, presiding officer. Um, can I ask the Minister to join me in paying tribute to the work of Sands Lothians and in particular that of Dorothy Maitland, who has done so much to support other families through what has been an unbelievably difficult process? Does he agree that the pain of the 253 families is deepened by the shocking findings of this report and the news that in many cases the families will never know what happened to their baby's ashes? Given this and the finding at page 548 of the report that the precise extent to which remains of babies have been mixed in with an adult cremation is also unknown but appears likely to be extensive, will he provide further details on the potential for a lasting and dignified memorial if that is something the parents would wish to see so that they can have a focal point for their own grief? Minister. Um, I, like um, Jamidi, uh, would like to acknowledge the uh, tremendous amount of work that Sands Lothian have taken forward and in particular uh, the way in which Dorothy Maitland has taken that uh, forward, uh, given that she's also an affected parent um, in this whole uh, tragedy as well. And uh, there is no doubt that the report from Dame Elish Angelini will reopen uh, many, many um, uh, difficult memories for uh, many families. Uh, with relate, regards to the memorial, I know that there are some recommendations within uh, Dame Ailey Shangelini's report around uh, the uh, existing ground at Morton Hall, and I've got no doubt that the Council will wish to uh, take forward those recommendations, and I would encourage them to do so uh, with affected parents. Uh, once we have uh, Lord Bonamy's report, um, I'd be more than happy uh, to uh, discuss with uh, respective organisations uh, the possibility of something on a national basis in terms of a memorial if that was felt appropriate. But I think uh, my guiding light uh, in any type of uh, memorial uh, would be uh, led by the affected parents and where they feel that would be appropriate in the first place. Neil Finlay, followed by Mark Biaggi. Uh, the findings of this report are multiple and very complex in nature and I think will reverberate across the UK, around Europe and possibly even beyond. We know that 200 families, over 200 families have been affected by practices at Morton Hall, but we don't know how many have been affected in other areas of Scotland. What action and advice has the government uh, taken and offered in respect of other Scottish local authorities and how they can establish what has gone on in their areas and what should other bereaved parents who may have suffered in a similar way now do to find out if this was indeed the case? 
Um, uh, once uh, Lord Bonamy's Commission uh, was established, one of its early acts was to write to all crematoria in Scotland, setting out uh, the process that they should put in place if they have any concerns raised by uh, parents regarding the cremation of uh, infants, and that they should adhere to that process in considering uh, those particular uh, concerns. Alongside that, uh, the, uh, Lord Bonamy's Commission is looking at the procedures and practices in place in every crematorium in Scotland uh, to evaluate whether there has been any aspects of their practice that is uh, not acceptable. Once we uh, have uh, Lord Bonamy's report, we will then be in a position to consider whether there are further measures we need to take regarding those specific crematoria uh, in any part of uh, the country. Uh, and the advice that was also given uh, at the time of the Lord Bonamy Commission was that any parents who did have concerns was to initially, as the legislation is at the present time, to raise it with the crematorium and to use, and for then for the crematorium to use advice that had been provided by Lord Bonamy in investigating uh, the matter. So once we've got the uh, Bonamy report, we'll be able to consider where there are specific crematoriums in Scotland that have been operating in a manner that is not acceptable, and we will then consider what measures need to be taken in order to investigate that further, if that's appropriate. Mark Biagi, followed by Jim Hume. Thank you, President Officer. The, the Minister has referred and now in several answers as well, referred to the, the plight of parents in other parts of Scotland, but also uh, there was one constituent of mine who had had an experience within Edinburgh in a different crematorium, uh, which was independently rather than local authority run and so had fallen out with the scope of the, the Morton Hall investigation. Um, can the, the Minister provide a, a guarantee that any changes and that also the review of what's been going on is going into all crematoria, no matter how they've been operated, and whether there will be any kind of a historical review, not just of, of practices at the moment, but uh, of cases that are continuing to bubble up from often 10 or 20 years ago? Minister? Uh, the uh, Lord Bonamy uh, Commission is looking at all crematoriums in Scotland. There are uh, 27. Uh, 14 are local authority, 12 are private, one of which is also um, a joint uh, local authority private uh, crematorium. Uh, all of those have been contacted by the Bonamy Commission uh, to look at their policy and practice and uh, procedures under which they operate. So I can give the member an assurance uh, that the approach that has been taken forward by the uh, Bonamy Commission is uh, for all establishments, public or private. Uh, and if there are individual cases that do come up, uh, and if there is a, a view that there may have been some form of uh, uh, criminal activity, uh, uh, the advice that uh, individuals are being given is to report that matter to Police Scotland, who have a team who will specifically investigate any individual circumstances that parents bring to them. Jim Hume, followed by Kezia Dugdale. Uh, firstly, thank you, President, President Officer. Firstly, I uh, wish to state that today my thoughts are with all 253 families affected by the Morton Hall tragedy. I know the Minister has mentioned that he, would, he wants to wait for Bonamy's findings, but does the Minister not agree with me and others across this chamber that regardless of what is contained in Lord Bonamy's findings, which will be of a technical nature concerning practices and legalities, it will not deliver all the answers that families across the country need and deserve, and only a full public inquiry can actually ascertain whether, whether other crematoria were involved, and that would help to avoid any further delay to the answers that families were promised. We need to know the mistakes of the past, that we can be sure that this can never happen again, and I, like other parties, will be happy to uh, help the government on that. Minister. Um, I'm grateful as well for the members' uh, support for any uh, needed legislative uh, changes that need to be uh, brought forward. As, as I've mentioned in a, a few of my answers here, I've uh, uh, we have not uh, ruled out the possibility of a public inquiry, but I do think it is right that we allow the due process of the Bonamy Commission to complete its work uh, uh, and to then come to a, a final decision uh, on that matter. Uh, I do think it is, though, worth emphasising that the approach that was taken by the investigation undertaken by Dame Elish Angelini resulted in 253 individual cases being investigated. Had we instigated a public inquiry at a national level, and not had the Dame Ailey Shangelini inquiry that was set up by Edinburgh City Council, those 253 cases would not have had the level of investigation that has now occurred. So we need to recognise that if the 
objective here is to ensure that any parents who have a concern wish their case to be thoroughly investigated in order to try and get the answers they are looking for, it may be that a public inquiry is not the best route in which to achieve that. But if it is the best route in which to achieve that, then as a government, we will consider that once we have received Lord Bonamy's report. But we need to make sure what the objective of any further investigation would be. And if that role and purpose is to try and give parents the answers they need around their own individual baby circumstances, then it may be a much more detailed investigation into their case is the best way to go about achieving that, just as has been the case with the Dame Ailey Shangelini uh, report. So I hope the member will be reassured that our commitment in this matter is to try and get the answers for parents as best we can and to try and find the best mechanism to achieve that. And if that can be served only by a public inquiry, then we will consider that. But if it can be achieved in a better way and in a quicker way, then we will also consider that as well. Okay, so Doug Deal, followed by Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Minister to clarify the role of Lord Bonamy's work with regards to the NHS? He'll be aware that the report looks at practices within hospitals and in particular at midwives and nurses who are dealing with families who have just lost a baby at the most immediate stage. If it's not the case that the NHS forms part of Lord Bonamy's review, could he look to revise the advice and guidance that midwives use to advise parents immediately after the death of a baby with immediate effect and make sure that practices that are happening today, tomorrow, next week don't need to be reviewed three months down the line when they could be reviewed today? Minister. Well, I can provide the member with the reassurance she requires. Lord Bonamy's uh, report and uh, commission is looking at the whole process. That's the funeral industry, crematoriums, local authorities, the private and also the NHS. So he is looking at the full process of dealing uh, with families who have lost a, a baby. And in Dame Elish Angelina's report, she highlights a number of failings within the NHS uh, that are unacceptable and will need to be addressed. And this government is ready to make sure, once we have Lord Bonamy's detailed report, to take forward the necessary action to ensure that staff within the NHS have the right skills and knowledge and the right support to give advice to parents in those tragic circumstances, the information they need to make an informed decision. Gordon MacDonald, followed by Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, given the number of recommendations in the report, can the Minister inform us um, what communication the Scottish Government has had with the Council since the report was published, as there are recommendations for both the Government and the Council to consider? Minister. Um, we have, uh, our officials have been in regular contact with uh, Edinburgh City Council since the publication um, of the report. The member may also be aware that the uh, City Council have announced that they intend to establish a, a working group to consider the recommendations that are set out in this uh, report. And uh, we've made it very clear to Edinburgh City Council we stand ready uh, to offer them uh, what assistance uh, and advice we can provide in order to support them in implementing these recommendations as swiftly as possible, uh, and we'll also take forward the recommendations that are set out for government uh, once we've got the uh, full report from Lord Bonamy to consider what further measures we need to take forward as well, which may have an impact on the way in which all of our local authorities in Scotland and our private crematoria operate uh, collectively. Sarah Boyock, followed by Colin Keir. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'd really like to pick up on the answers the Minister has given to a couple of colleagues about what happens next in terms of parents living in other parts of Scotland. Um, there's the issue of when the timetable would be for the introduction of legislation following both the Morton Hall report and the Bonamy Commission, but it's also thinking about the impact of these reports on parents in other parts of Scotland, what the routes will be for them to get questions that they might have answered, which are very personal answers, as you've acknowledged, are not just about the operation of different crematoria, but what has been the situation in their own family and in their own experience. And I think it would be helpful to get some sense of the way forward as to how you think that will be addressed. Um, you've said you don't think a public inquiry is appropriate, um, or you're, you're not ruling it out, but you haven't said what the alternative mechanisms might be and who might commission them. In, this, in Edinburgh, it was the council that commissioned this report. What would be the alternative in other parts of Scotland? I recognise the uh, member's desire to try and uh, set up a very clear path <laughs> for uh, going forward. I think um, uh, I want to be a bit cautious about uh, setting out too much detail as to uh, what that path may be, because uh, if we 
uh, choose to have a public inquiry or a different approach, that will be determined on the basis of what we receive from Lord Bonamy in his report. Uh, and obviously, uh, it, the, uh, either option could or any option would go in a different directions. So I want to give the member reassurance that what we are, will try to do is, once we have received Lord Bonamy's report, is it will then come to an informed decision about whether we are going to have a public inquiry or not. If we are not, we will then consider what measures could be taken forward to help those parents in other parts of Scotland that feel that their, their own individual circumstances have not been thoroughly investigated. And if we are to provide something to achieve that for them, in what form that would come uh, to make sure that parents have the confidence and the reassurance that it's going to do the right type of thing for them and they can trust the nature of that investigation. So I don't want to set out what option will be because or what that alternative option would be because it would appear as though I'm just completely ruling out a public inquiry. I want to reassure members that it has not been completely ruled out until we've got Lord Bonamy's report. And once we have his report, we can then make an informed decision about what's the best way going forward. Before I call Colm Keir, can I say that I've got another seven members who've already indicated that they wish to ask a question of the Minister. I intend to allow this session to run on uh, for as long as it takes to allow those seven questions to be asked and answered. That will impact on the debate that follows, uh, but we'll give you guidance from the Chair um, when we come to the next debate. But I think, um, given the importance of this, I think that's the right thing to do. Um, I call Colin Keir, followed by Mark, uh, call, sorry, Colin Keir, followed by Drew Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Minister for bringing forward the statement and pay, also pay tribute to the parents in Sands Lothian. Can the Minister expand on how much consideration there has been of the report from Dr Clive Chamberlain, which appears in an annex to the main report? Um, I am aware that he was a specialist that was used by uh, uh, the Dame Angelini uh, team to give them expert advice uh, on matters. Um, uh, as I outlined in my statement, Dame Emily Shangelini and Lord Bonamy have worked very closely uh, and the uh, full report has been submitted to the Lord Bonamy Commission, including the annex which the member makes reference to. And I've got no doubt that Lord Bonamy's Commission will want to uh, consider uh, this particular uh, piece of evidence that was submitted uh, by, uh, by the expert who uh, provided support to uh, Dame Emily Shangelini's uh, report. So it will be considered by the Bonamy Commission. Drew Smith, followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. I uh, reiterate Joanne Lamont's comments that there are parents in Glasgow who believe that they have been affected by this tragic scandal. And those that I've spoken to believe that a full public inquiry is needed to have a chance at the answers. And critical to that is their belief, uh, is their loss of trust because they believe that they have been misled um, before. Now, I understand that Lord Bonamy will report very soon, but uh, does the Minister understand that every day in sleepless night, that such an inquiry is delayed um, adds to the prolonged ang anguish um, for those families. And, and further to Sarah Boyack's question, President Officer, can I ask uh, the Minister whether he would indicate, in terms of an, any alternative to a public inquiry, whether that is something that Lord Bonamy has been asked to make any recommendation about, or would he expect Lord uh, Bonamy to say more about the potential routes to, to get the answers that these families need? Minister. Uh, I recognise that there are those parents in Glasgow and other parts of the country who may feel that they haven't uh, had the level of investigation into their case in the same way that uh, parents affected at Morton Hall have. Um, uh, but I'm sure the member will recognise, as I've said on a number of occasions now, I think it is right that we allow the Bonamy Commission uh, time to do its work. It will report in the coming weeks. Uh, and I want to give the member an assurance that uh, we will come to a position uh, uh, very soon after we've received the report on what is the best way forward to try and help uh, uh, take this issue forward. So there's no intention on our part to try and delay matters. And once we've got Lord Bonamy's report, we will try and respond as quickly as possible. For example, one of the things that we will ask the Bonamy Commission to do, because it has committed to sharing its report with parents, affected parents, before it's published, is whether parents would wish the Bonamy report to be published alongside that, having the Scottish Government's response to its recommendations. That may take a little bit longer to do to allow us to consider the recommendations, but it may mean that it's one report that's published rather than waiting for the Bonamy report and then our response to it. If parents feel that would be helpful to them, I'm more than happy to uh, work with the Commission to achieve that in order to try and give parents answers as quickly as possible 
from the Scottish Government's perspective and what we're going to do in moving forward. Mark Macdonald, followed by Alice McInnes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister obviously has referred to other parts of Scotland and Aberdeen as one area where there have been concerns around practices. I note today that the Housing and Environment Convener at the Council has announced that there will be a review into the process. And given that the Minister has announced that legislation will be brought forward uh, during this parliamentary session, what guarantees can you give that there will be discussions with those councils who are undertaking reviews of their practices to ensure that any reviews and actions that are taken are complementary to the legislative process and not contradictory to ensure that there is a joined up approach? Minister. The review that the member uh, makes reference to is a, a process that was actually set out by Lord Bonamy, and I would encourage Aberdeen City Council to uh, follow the guidance that has been issued by the Bonamy Commission on what that process should be. Uh, and it is set out in a form which is to ensure that affected parents can have confidence in the process and that it is independent of the Council's processes itself. So I would encourage them uh, to do that. Of course, uh, in taking forward any legislation, we will have to engage with stakeholders uh, in order to consider these matters in detail. And I'm sure all members will recognise, although we will want to move swiftly in this matter, we also need to make sure we take considered time to make sure we get it right uh, so that there is no repeat of this type of uh, situation again. Uh, but the member can be assured that we will work with all stakeholders to make sure that any legislative changes are ones which make sure that these types of issues can never occur again. And I finally, I would encourage, as I say, uh, Aberdeen City Council to follow the process that has been outlined by Lord Bonamy in carrying out any review of their own process. Alice McInnes, followed by Alison John. Thank you very much. Bereaved parents in my region suffer the same heartache and did raise concerns about Aberdeen crematorium last year. And in response, the Council carried out what I think was an extremely limited sample audit of records, and I'm grateful now that they are looking again at it. Dame Elish Angelini also recommends that crematoria should not be allowed to continue with cremating infants unless they can demonstrate competence in achieving remains. Does, can the Minister give me his assurance that every support will be given to Aberdeen City Council and indeed councils around the country to ensure that they can act promptly to develop the necessary competence and thereby ensure that the utmost respect and dignity is accorded to the handling of infant remains. Minister. Uh, the member may be aware that there are uh, a, a couple of professional bodies that are responsible for uh, standards within the cremation uh, and burial industry. And uh, as Dame Elish Angelini has outlined in her own report, they have uh, to some degree been found wanting uh, in relation to uh, some of the uh, practices that they have issued guidance on. So what will be important is once we've got Lord Bonamy's report, is to make sure uh, that those uh, different uh, regulatory bodies are actually, uh, if you like, uh, operating on the same standards and that they are effectively being implemented. Uh, and we have to look at the action we take forward in uh, any future legislation is how we can make sure that that has been properly adhered to uh, and what uh, potential sanctions could be if it's not been properly adhered to. Alison Johnson and then finally Bob Doris. Thank you. I am grateful that this thorough investigation has occurred at Morton Hall and recognise the part played by those brave parents who campaigned through grief that we can barely contemplate. It is difficult to understand why these procedures were ever deemed acceptable and it is hard to think of a situation that requires more sympathetic and compassionate attention and care than the cre cremation of a much-loved baby. Will the government work with local authorities to ensure that those working in crematoria possess all the necessary attributes, not solely paper qualifications, to carry out all aspects of this incredibly important work with the greatest sensitivity. Thank you. Minister. I am more than happy to give the member that reassurance. And going forward, I think that is one of the important lessons that needs to be learned, is to make sure that the staff have the right type of empathy and attitude uh, for that particular role. And clearly, local authorities have an important role in making sure they have the right staff uh, to carry out this type of work. But equally, I also want to make sure that those private sector crematoria have the right staff as well uh, and are able to uh, offer parents, brave parents, the right type of support and assistance in their time of need. So, uh, yes, uh, but let's also make sure uh, that private crematoria are also doing the same thing uh, and offering a good quality service. Bob Doris. Um, Minister, uh, when I meet affected parents in Glasgow, uh, once again, 
this Monday. Can I reassure them that the Scottish Government would use any mechanism it takes to maximise the opportunity for them getting the, the detailed answers that they most desperately need, but also, Minister whilst I, and I do welcome the additional resources that the First Minister uh, announced earlier on today, uh, concerns had previously been raised with me that resources for bespoke counselling services were under great pressure. So can I ask that this will be kept under constant review? Because the more publicity this gets, the more people will be re-traumatised by the effects of losses, whether they've been affected by the Babies Ashes scandal or otherwise. Minister. Um, I am aware um, of the concern that there was for some parents in the Glasgow area around the support and counselling services that may be available to affected parents. And uh, last year, there was the Forget Me Not um, uh, counselling service, care and counselling service, which was uh, established by one of the affected parents. And um, uh, we were able to provide them with some start-up funding in order to establish the organisation. Uh, and uh, they are one of the organisations that we are in contact with uh, to establish whether they require any further support uh, in terms of financial resource uh, to allow them to be able to continue to provide support uh, to affected uh, parents in the, uh, in the west of Scotland. Thank you. That ends the um, statement uh, from the Minister. Uh, before we move on to the um, next debate, can I indicate to members at this stage that the open debate speakers intend to reduce their time from six minutes to five minutes, so you can start working on your speeches now. Um, and that will get us back on track uh, for decision time at five o'clock. So can I now call the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 9847, in the name of David Stewart, on petition number 1453, Organ Donation in Scotland. Members who wish to speak in the debate should press the request to speak button now. And I call on David Stewart to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Public Petitions Committee. Mr Stewart, you've got your full 13 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. The petition system is the window to our Parliament. It's etched in our history and has been echoed in Parliaments across the globe. Today's debate is an example of how to petition effectively. I want to praise the Evening Times and Kidney Research UK Scotland for their first-class work. Uh, Caroline Wilson from the Evening Times is in the gallery today, and congratulations on the work that you carried out. I welcome the opportunity given to Parliament today to highlight the issues raised in the petition and the evidence received to date by the committee during the course of its work. The Evening Times petition was lodged in November 2012 and currently has attracted more than 20,000 supporters, calling for the Scots Government to introduce a knocked-out system of organ donation in Scotland to help save more lives. As Tony Carlin, the editor of the Evening Times, said in evidence to my committee on the 11th of December 2012, and I quote, I could speak for hours about some of the stories that we've been told about or have come across in the course of our campaign. The anguish of parents who have watched their children needlessly die of genetic conditions that could have been resolved with a transplant. The desperation of a man who flew to India in the hope of buying a kidney. The deep satisfaction that is felt by grieving relatives who have, following the death of a loved one, uh, counseled themselves with the knowledge, consoled themselves with the knowledge that others have been given the gift of life. However, there is little point in detailing these stories because each of you knows or has read of people in the same position waiting for the phone call that may never come while living a life of increasing misery, fear and despair." Unquote. So currently presiding officer in the UK, we have an opt-in system through opt-out legislation for Wales will come into force next year. For now, however, I or any other person can actively decide to donate organs or tissue by joining the organ donor register. We are required to actively opt in. An opt-out system requires an individual to explicitly make it known whilst they are alive that they are not in favour of their organs being used for transplant when they die. So the key system is, the key difference then is, an opt-in system involves people expressly stating a wish that their organs and tissues can be used on, for a transplant on their death. On the other hand, an opt-out system assumes that organs and tissues are available for transplant unless there is a specific instruction to the contrary. The petitioner and others argue that moving to an opt-out system will increase the availability of organs for transplant. So the decisions we in Scotland, indeed in any other country, uh, need to involve, involve ethical, legal, medical, organisational and societal components. The important balance to be struck 
is between respecting the views and rights of a potential donor and obtaining organs in an efficient manner. In the UK at present, the fundamental principle is that organs are donated actively, freely, voluntarily and unconditionally using a soft opt-in system. Now, organ donation is not a new topic for the Scottish Parliament or indeed for the Evening News, Evening Times, who have campaigned for a number of years. The Health and Sport Committee did work in this area in 1996 and my friend George Fawkes held a members debate on presumed consent in the last session. And in early 2008, this Parliament dated the report of the UK Organ Donation Task Force. So the UK Task Force has been asked to identify barriers to organ donation and the factors that might have a bearing on donation rates across the UK. It spent two years looking in detail at the issues before reaching its conclusions and recommendations. It did not recommend making any change in 2008 to the UK's existing system, but recommended that action be taken within the existing frameworks to increase levels of organ donation by 50% within five years. The priority being to promote organ donation more widely and to raise levels of consent, improve public awareness and ensure best practice at all stages of the donation process. The task force, noticed, uh, the task force noted that countries with opt-out system tended to have a higher organ donation rates, but that, and I quote, presumed consent alone does not explain the variation in organ donation rates between different countries. Many other factors affect donation rates, end quote. So the legal and ethical implications of introducing an opt-out system was considered in detail by the task force and it didn't identify any barriers to the introduction of a soft opt-out system so long as sufficient safeguards uh, were built in. So in 2008, the position of the task force accepted by the Scottish Government was that although a move to an opt-out system would bring about real benefits, there were risks and any changes would have to have careful consideration of the risks. The task force made 14 recommendations for increasing organ donation throughout the UK without moving to an opt-out system. After a period of five years, the task force recommended that progress would be reviewed, at which point the option of opt-out could be considered again. At the time, when we debated that report and its conclusions, I recall the Cabinet Secretary for Health saying that though the Scottish Government was not considering opt-out for Scotland, she had increasing sympathy with the presumed consent and the Scottish Government planned to review its position in five years' time. We are now six years on. Public support for change is growing, and I'd like to pay tribute to the contribution made by the Evening Times to keep the issue in the spotlight and engage and influence the public in what can be an emotive subject. Of course, Scotland has not been standing still on the issue since 2008. The Scottish Government has been running the annual organ donation campaigns. And there's the Scottish Campaign website, and last year it published its donation, the transplantation plan, coming 2013 and 14. And NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde have run the Respect My Dying Wish campaign to encourage debate and discussion, to reduce the frequency of which relatives refuse to allow the use of organs, even when the deceased person is signed up to the donor register. It's very welcome to see that sign-ups to the donor register are high in Scotland, as at the end of March 2014, more than 2 million people living in Scotland had made their organ donation wishes known by joining the UK Organ Donor Register. That's around 40% of the Scottish population, as compared with the UK average of 32%. However, as in March this year, there were still more than 600 people in Scotland waiting for an organ to become available. I've already mentioned that we've seen the Welsh Assembly recently take the steps to legislate. In acknowledgement of this, the Public Petitions Committee had a very useful and thought-provoking evidence session in February this year with the Welsh Minister for Health and Social Services. After hearing what's been done in Wales and what was achieved with cross-party agreement, the view of the Public Petitions Committee was that it would be good to take stock of where we are in Scotland on organ donation and levels of consent and see if there's more that we'd be doing to maintain progress. Uh, Mark Drakeford, who is the Welsh Health Minister, told us that in Wales last year, 35 people on the waiting list for an organ died. Those deaths were the main motivation for making the changes and for increasing the efforts to improve consent rates in Wales. The debate in the Welsh Assembly began in 2008. The Minister was keen to stress that deemed consent was not something that they moved towards quickly. Over the course of a number of years, and by the time of the Welsh Assembly elections in 2011, three of the four political parties represented in the Assembly included a commitment in their manifesto to legislate to create a system for deemed consent. 
After the elections, the discussion process continued, leading up to the legislation being passed. The legislation is due to come into force in December 2015. There will be a two-year lead-in to the legislation going live. Christine Graham. I'd, uh, so I was in the debate in 2008 uh, with Lord Fuchs. Um, can you please clear up for me the difference between deemed consent and presumed consent? I'm just going to okay, cover that, and if the member has a bit of patience, I'll cover that at the end of my contribution. When it does come into force, there will be three choices available in Wales. First of all, continue to opt in with names placed on the register, and hopefully this will help the members' um, points I've just raised, and opt out and have that decision recorded in the existing UK-wide register, which we revise to take account of the legislative change, and choose to do nothing, and that will mean that consent to organisation will be deemed, and that is known as soft opt-out. We were told that the process for opting out would be very straightforward, uh, with people being able to opt out at GP surgeries, online or by phone. And during the two-year period between passing the legislation and coming into force, in the Welsh Government and the health authorities have been engaging in a process of awareness raising and education to ensure that people in Wales are aware of the changes to the law and the new choices they will have. I'm actually very short of time. I do apologise to the member, but I am really keen to get this on the record. We were told that the legislation has been a popular success and they gained substantial and growing public support. Information campaigns have been targeted at groups of people for whom it's judged that more needed to be done to ensure that they were informed. Faith groups is one such example, where additional steps were taken to improve levels of understanding, especially given that faith groups have made it clear they were in favour of increasing rates of organ donation. Young people are another group to which campaigns have been targeted, particularly 16 and 17 year olds. People will not be capable of having their consent deemed until the age of 18, but as young people approach that age, it would be important for them to be aware of the options and the choices available. The use of real-life case studies has been found in Wales to have been extremely powerful in swaying public opinion, and we were told that a good bank of case studies had been established. The Minister told us they expect 45 more organs to become available as a result of this legislation, or 15 new donors a year. On average, three organs come from each donor. A feature of the Welsh legislation, and another aspect the Minister was keen to stress, was the continuing involvement of the family at the point of donation. In any situation of deemed consent, where a person has not indicated their wishes either way on the register, the family will always be asked whether they have any better information about the potential donor's views and wishes. The Minister stressed that the family has not been asked for their own views, but rather to indicate what they know of the potential donor's views. However, we must not underestimate how difficult it must be for a family to find themselves having to deal with the death of a loved one and at the same time to be asked about organ donation. It is understandable that some families when faced with such a situation might, might feel unable to take such a decision. There might be a variety of reasons, but we know from research that sometimes a family feels unable to agree to organ donation or an occasion can override the wishes of the deceased. Being able to guarantee that the donor's instructions are carried out and not overridden by the family was discussed at length in Wales during the passage of the legislation. The Welsh Minister told us that they decided on two safeguards. The first safeguard is that people will still be able to opt in or opt out, a person who is a strong supporter of organ donation, and the other side, a person who has strong views that they do not wish to donate, can record their wishes on the register. Further, a person who is anxious that his views might be contested by a family member and who has a different view will be able to appoint a representative who will exercise consent on their behalf to the clinical team. Where a representative has been appointed, that person can take priority over the family. The thinking behind that, if an individual is taking the trouble to appoint a representative, that person's views will be the one that prevails. Where people have no family, or if they've appointed a representative, the donation will go ahead. If somebody dies and there's no family or representative can be found, the donation will not be progressed. Um, having said that, um, no parliament, of course, can legislate for every contingency. And the minister told us that uh, one of the conclusions reached in the legislation uh, was that as they made its way uh, through the Assembly. Um, to finish up, uh, presiding officers, I'm conscious of time. We know that there are costs involved with the introduction of Wales in this system. We are advised that 7.5 million have been set aside to support a range of activities around the law change. But the minister advised that all evidence available suggested that if Wales was able to secure just two more donations, the system would pay for itself given the cost of kidney dialysis. If two people could be taken off dialysis, the cost savings would cover the cost of the law change. 
It seems almost incredible that such a small change in the number of donations would ensure the cost of the legislation is covered, and this certainly grabbed the committee's attention. Uh, to conclude, presiding officer, I welcome the opportunity to debate the issues raised in the petition and look forward to hearing the views of colleagues in the chamber this afternoon. Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Michael Matheson, Minister, up to nine minutes, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I welcome uh, this afternoon's debate, and as any interest in organ donation is a, a good thing, and I'm also very grateful for the work that's been undertaken by the committee uh, in this particular issue. Uh, the Scottish Government remains committed to increasing organ donations in Scotland. Uh, I don't believe any other country in the UK can say that it's done more in this agenda over the last five years than what's happened here in Scotland. However, it would be fair to say that we remain unconvinced that we should make any move to introduce an opt-out system right now. I want to make sure that we keep this issue under review and to learn from what happens in Wales. But we are making great progress uh, here in Scotland with the programme of activity that we already have underway. Now, I know that people believe that opt-out will mean more organs will become available, but our own experts tell us that this is not necessarily the case. Opt-out means increasing the proportion of the population on the organ donor register. But you do not need to be on the organ donor register to be a donor. Over the last five years, 62% of all donors in Scotland are not on the donor register. The real issue that limits the number... Can I just finish this point? The real issue that limits the number of donors is the number of people who die in circumstances where donation is possible. Unfortunately, to become an organ donor, you really have to die in intensive care, and only about 1% of deaths in Scotland occur in these circumstances. Sadly, that's something opt-out in itself cannot change. And I'll give way to the member. David Stewart. Would the Minister care to comment on the quote from the petition itself, which said that when Belgium switched to an opt-out system of organisation in 1986, there was an 86% rise in the number of kidneys uh, retrieved for life-saving transplants? Minister. Well, I think that's a very welcome thing, but I want to move on to the issue of international comparison because you have to take them with a significant level of caution. Uh, I know, too, uh, that the argument, as the member has just made, is that other countries with opt-out systems have higher donation rates. Some countries with opt-out systems do have higher donation rates than Scotland. Spain is often mentioned, but Spain had opt-out in place for 10 years before their donation rates started to increase. There is also uh, some areas where Scotland does better than Spain. We have a much higher rate of organ donation than Spain does, uh, much living organ donation uh, than Spain does. So we must be cautious when we take that type of international comparison forward. There are many differences in how organ donation works, not just opt-out. Some countries, like the USA, do not have opt-out, but they have much higher donation rates than Scotland. And there are countries like Sweden that has an opt-out system, but have lower donation rates than we have here in Scotland. What this means is that there is no single thing that will bring about the revolution in donation rates, and we need to look at the whole system in order to increase donation rates. As I've said, Scotland is already doing very well. In the last six years, we have almost doubled the number of donors in Scotland. We have delivered a 62% increase in the number of transplants being carried out in Scotland, the highest in any part of the UK. And there's been a 25% reduction in the transplant waiting list since 2006-2007. But I also want to reassure members that just because we are not yet convinced by opt-out, that does not mean that we are doing nothing. We are delivering a significant programme of work. Last year, we published a seven-year plan containing 21 separate actions we intend to take forward. And I'd like to encourage members to read this document in full, to see the many things uh, that we are working on. Uh, but the key point is that this plan was written in partnership with the Scottish donation and transplant community. 
the people working with donors and delivering transplants on a day-in, day-out basis. The priorities that we've set out in our plan are the things that they told us we need to do in Scotland to increase donation rates even further. And the success that we've seen over the last five years is down to these very people. Therefore, I think it is important that given that we've achieved the success we have on the basis of the advice that we've been given by the donor and the transplant community in Scotland, it's important we listen to their advice in going forward here in Scotland. Mr. Officer, we're making the best progress in the UK, working with our donation and transplant community. We're seeing more donors and we're delivering more transplants and we're saving more lives as a result. Now, I do welcome members' interest in this issue and I'd like to offer my reassurance that we'll continue to keep uh, a look, a review on how the opt-out process progresses in Wales. But while we're making the sort of progress that we have been delivering here in Scotland over recent years, I believe that it's prudent and appropriate that we should wait to see what happens in Wales before we start to introduce significant legislative change here in Scotland. So, President Officer, although we are not convinced about opt-out at this present point, I want to reassure members about the range of actions that have been taken forward over the last five years, and I hope members are reassured by the very significant improvements we have achieved here in Scotland, better than any other part of the UK, which is reflective of the improvements we have made in the donor and transplant system in Scotland. Many thanks. And I now call on Rhoda Grant. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this is an extremely important debate, and I'm grateful to the Petitions Committee to, for bringing it forward to the Chamber and indeed to the petitioners, the Evening Times and Kidney Research UK, eh, for bringing their petition for a soft opt out organ donation system eh, to the Parliament. As we've heard, there are around 600 people in Scotland waiting for an organ transplant. Sadly, some of them will die before being offered a transplant. Yet we could come closer to meeting that need if everyone who could donate did donate. Donation is like giving somebody the gift of life. However, in Scotland, we ask families to make that decision at the most harrowing time of their lives. Corn corneas can be donated as late as 24 hours after death, but the other organs need a body to be kept on life support to allow donation to happen, and therefore decisions need to be taken very quickly. The petition calls for a soft opt-out system that, the same, similar to that that has been adopted in Wales. The Welsh system presumes consent but allows people to opt out if they can also confirm their wish to opt they can also confirm their wish to opt in. If no preference is registered, then the assumption is that they wish to donate. At the time of death, family are asked if they know whether or not that pe person wished to opt out. They are not asked to make a choice, but simply confirm if they can their loved one's wishes. If they do not know their loved one's wishes, donation is presumed. If donation appears to add to the distress of families, then it's up to the trained staff in the donation unit to make a decision whether or not to take that donation. However, if a potential donor knows that their family's wishes will be that they do not donate, they can nominate a representative to make their views clear and that representative can overrule their family wishes. This system has the ability to increase donation. 90% of people agree with donation, but yet only 41% of Scots have registered on the organ donation register. We know that when the next of kin are asked, 43% refuse donation if they don't know their loved one's wishes, and that's even if they're informed that their loved one was indeed on the organ donation register. If they've had a prior discussion, then we know that only 11, just over 11% refuse donation. I'm often concerned that people are asked to make this decision at a time of great distress, and it's almost impossible for them to think straight. I wonder how many come to regret uh, the decision to refuse donation because they have time to reflect on it and maybe reconsider. Given that only 10% object to donation, it's surely best to ask them to register that objection. This way, every potential donor can have their own wishes prevail. Our system puts the onus on the next of kin. A soft opt-out system puts the, owner on the onus on the donor themselves. 
Previously, the Scottish Government had indicated support for a soft-out system, but today they appear to be pulling back from that, and that's really disappointing. I would urge them to consider, because if they wait for an evaluation of the changes in Wales, we'll be well into the next decade before we see that changes happening in Scotland, and that will be too late for pretty much everyone who's already waiting on the donor register. We need to make a step change now, and I would urge the Minister to reconsider. It's true that whatever system of donor registration we have in place, um, we need to underline the need for families to have that discussion with loved ones so they know what their wishes are. I've made it clear to my family what their wishes are, and I would urge everybody else to do the same. However, we can't just depend on registration. We must take other steps to increase donation, and there's a lot more we can and should do. Um, donation and registration is markedly lower in the black and ethnic minority groups, while the need for donation is higher. There are also issues around religious belief. Within Jewish and Muslim communities, there's a requirement for quick burial. However, it's possible to allow this and facilitate these donations with some thought and planning. More work needs to be done within those communities to ensure that we have a sufficient number of donors to meet need. There's also the issue of suboptimal organs. Due to the shortage of organs available, clinicians now have to look at suboptimal organs. Those are organs from older people or people who have died from illness rather than accident. And when I was first told about this, I expressed surprise, but I was told when your organs are not working at all, then frankly, any old replacement organ will do. Um, the suboptimal organs can buy the recipient time, and I think it's important we pursue how we do this. The donation process also requires access to life support in order to keep organs functioning while preparation is made for harvesting. There's also a requirement for theatre facilities to allow retrieval to happen. Retrieval teams can take the donor back to specialist centres to harvest organs, but this can be distressing for the family, especially in cultures where loved ones' bodies are normally kept close until burial. There are, these issues are especially important in rural areas, where many potential donors are not given the opportunity to donate. We need to review facilities in order to put together local action plans for donation that identify pathways that can be used. It would require an audit of facilities and skills, as well as the, how we facilitate retrieval teams coming um, into the area. There are many other um, options we can look at, presiding officer, but I'm conscious time is running out. Therefore, I would urge the Scottish Government to come forward with legislation we now need to introduce a soft opt-out. Wales has put it in place, and they have put in place the systems that are required. We could act now, and we should. Thanks very much. Now, Colin Jackson, Carlo, up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I first of all congratulate the petitioners who have led to the debate we are having here today, which is a significant debate. It is the first time since I joined this Parliament that there will be a vote at the end of a discussion on the subject of organ donation, the previous donation, uh, debates in which I participated, having been members' business occasions. Uh, can I say straight away that, uh, somewhat to my surprise, and I find I agreed with every word that the Minister said in his speech in this debate. Uh, for Conservatives, this has always been a vote of conscience. Uh, I don't know whether that is the position of other parties, but we have said that when it comes to any legislative change, individual members will be able to come to their own view. However, all Conservative members will support the motion tonight, because we are of the view uh, that while some yet remain to be persuaded, and I'm not one of those who has any issue with the principle that we are discussing here today, uh, we do now have a fully worked through legislative solution being implemented in Wales from December 2015. But we do not yet know whether that fully worked through legislative solution will prove to be wholly robust or wholly effective. And it does seem to me that the Minister's assert, assert, assessment that the best course of action is to remain sympathetic to what is being done and to wait and see and watch carefully and use that then, if it is successful, as a template for legislation in this Parliament. And the one thing I slightly regret already in the opening speeches is just the hint that we could suddenly find a politicisation 
of organ donation emerging in this parliament because one of the things that was said by the Welsh minister and the evidence he gave to the petitions committee is that fundamental to its success was the broadest possible coalition of political support underpinning any legislative progress. Yes. Christine Graham. I, I haven't spoken to my whips, but that doesn't matter. Uh, would the member agree with me that this is one of those issues in which we would hope the parties would have a free vote? Well, Jackson Carlo? I personally would, but that's not for me to take beyond uh, the position the Conservatives will take. Now, if I haven't had a concern on this issue of principle, I have had a, a concern about the issue of robustness. Because as the Minister pointed out, Scotland has the highest level of voluntary uh, registered donation of any of the nations within the United Kingdom. And 62% of those people who subsequently uh, are donors are not on that register. And that has been done, I think, because there is a broad appreciation within Scottish public opinion about the desirability and the need for people to offer uh, organs on death. But there is a distinction in the minds of some about the voluntary nature of that donation or that donation being achieved on a voluntary basis in concert with the family who remain and the presumption that the state now owns your body at the point of death, which is a completely different proposition. My concern about robustness goes slightly further and it's this. That voluntary, that voluntary support for organ donation in Scotland has been hard won. And I'm afraid there is a history of failure within the NHS, particularly in systems, uh, for public confidence to be assured that the, the wishes of an individual will in fact subsequently be observed. And nothing, nothing would be more detrimental, if I make this point, nothing would be more detrimental to voluntary organ donation in Scotland than were we to move to a system where thereafter it was demonstrated that the wishes of an individual were not respected either way, because I'm afraid we live in an environment where we know the media would make the widest possible uh, hay with that particular event, and it could have a fundamentally detrimental effect on public opinion. I'm going to give way to Drew Smith, who sought to intervene first, and then I will take Rhoda Grant. Drew uh, Smith? Uh, um, as ever, very grateful to, to Jackson Carlo, but, but would you not accept that under the system we have at the moment, people's wishes are not being respected? Simply carrying a card and if you are, uh, I don't know whether we would say fortunate or unfortunate, but in the circumstances of your death that you were able to make the, made a donation, you made a decision to carry that card, and there is no guarantee that your wishes would be respected at all under the current system. Yeah, I, which is why I'm sympathetic to the opt-in, uh, the, the system that is being progressed in Wales. But I think there is a distinction between that and a legislative change under which the uh, wishes of an individual are not respected, because I think, frankly... Uh, the non-observance of that could have a far more detrimental effect on public opinion. Were it to be proven subsequently that somebody's organs were used when they had asked that they not be, then I think that could end up prejudicing very significantly public opinion. Rhoda Grant. Rhoda Grant. Um, the point that Drew Smith made was the one I was going to make, but can I be clear that there is an opt-out and a register that people can opt uh, can make their wishes known? There is the fallback system of you tell your family you don't want to, to be a donor, so you've got uh, basically belt and braces in the, in the soft opt-out system. And I Jack accept Carlo. that point. I accept both those points, which is why I would like to see the system that is being, uh, has been constructed for Wales, and I took, we took very considerable efforts from Mark Drakeford, which I think was very persuasive. It is why I would like to see that system tested in order that I can be assured that the very points you make prove in practice to be substantiated uh, on, uh, in the event. Uh, were that to be the case, then in the next Parliament, I think there would be uh, scope for the Minister, uh, for the Government, having considered the practice in Wales, to consider whether or not to bring forward a legislative solution at that time. As you at this close, stage, please. we remain unpersuaded, but sympathetic. Many thanks. And we now move to open debate, five minute speeches, or thereby, I call on Angus MacLeod to be followed by Drew Smith. Okay, thank you, uh, President Officer. Um, firstly, I'd like to extend my thanks to uh, Caroline Wilson, who brought this petition uh, to the committee on behalf of the Evening Times and the Kidney Research UK uh, Scotland. Um, as we've heard from the convener, uh, the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to introduce an opt-out system of organ donation to help save more lives. 
and saving lives is the crux of this matter. Organ donation saves lives, therefore increasing the rate of donation will obviously allow us to save more lives. Now, NHS blood and transplant report that in Scotland, as of the 8th of April this year, 595 patients are waiting for a transplant. Last year, unfortunately, 34 people died in Scotland while waiting for a transplant and more are taken off the waiting list as they become too ill to receive an organ. A conservative estimate from the British Medical Association reports that around 70% of people are willing to donate their organs after death, but Scotland has only 40% of the population register, uh, registered as organ donors, a figure that I am um, both proud of and ashamed of. Proud because for the last five years the number of transplants has gone up, as the Minister has referred to. Uh, the waiting list has got smaller and now Scotland has around 8% more registered donors than the rest of the UK. And these improvements are due to the efforts of this Scottish Government and the Regional Health Board in implementing the Organ Donation Task Force recommendations from the 2008 report. However, I am concerned because lives are still being lost unnecessarily because people who are willing to donate organs after their death simply never get round to making their views known. And this results in relatives making a decision without knowing the deceased was willing to donate. For this reason, I believe it is essential that we look at ways in which the organ donation system can be improved further to reduce the number of avoidable deaths, since, uh, particularly since 2008. Uh, the implementation of the Organ Donation Task Force recommendations have seen significant improvements in the infrastructure and increased donor rates. Now, uh, now that this has reached uh, fruition and the new systems and arrangements have become settled, we need to decide as a, as a society and as a parliament what the next steps should be. We have a very well organised, well funded and comprehensive infrastructure in place to facilitate organ donation, but clearly there is still a great deal of scope for improvement. The Organ Donation Task Force commissioned the Univers University of York to undertake a systematic review of all relevant published data on an opt-out system of organ donation. Of the countries they looked at, they found opt-out law or practice was associated with an increase of 21 to 30 per cent in the rate of donation following the introduction of an opt-out system. It would be misleading of me, however, not to inform Parliament that the study found a number of other factors also appear to be associated with improved organ donation rates, such as transplant capacity, health expenditure per capita and public awareness. But I believe that these areas have already been improved on, and indeed the 2013 publication taking organ transplantation to 2020 follows up on the previous Organ Donation Task Force 2008 report and shifts focus to donor apathy. The new strategy builds on the achievement of an increase in donor registration and focuses on reducing high family refusal rates, which at 43% is one of the highest in the Western world. However, if Scotland was to move to an opt-out system of organ donation, we would not be starting from scratch, as well as the examples of the well-established opt-out systems in Spain, Austria, Portugal and Belgium that uh, have, uh, some have been referred to already this afternoon, uh, the Scottish Government can follow the precedent set by the Welsh Assembly. Um, the Welsh Act received royal assent in, uh, on the 10th of September last year, and it does, of course, introduce a soft-out system. Uh, and the committee was pleased to take evidence from Mark Drakeford, AM, a Minister for Health and Social Services, during a very useful video link. Uh, and I had hoped to cover the points raised during uh, that session, however, my time is limited. But I, I do welcome the Minister's assurance that he will follow progress in Wales uh, with interest, although it will be at least, uh, I believe, two years before we'll be able to judge whether it's been successful. Uh, in closing, President Officer, I take on board the Minister's view that the Scottish Government is not yet convinced of the benefits. However, I believe that it's clear that an opt-out system is an effective mechanism to increase the availability of organs for transplant and ultimately save the lives of people with end-stage organ failure who have no other treatment options available to them. I'm of the opinion that uh, an opt-out system of organ donation should be uh, considered as part of the Scottish Government's broader strategy to improve donation rates. Under the system, individuals would have exactly the same choice as, a, as, you uh, close, as in an opt-in system to donate or not to donate. Uh, therefore, in closing, uh, President Officer, I therefore look forward to the issue being debated in Parliament further with a view to progress being made on the issue, hopefully at some time in the not too distant future. Thank you. Many thanks. I call on Drew Smith to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you very much, President Officer. I'm grateful to have this opportunity to speak 
uh, in the debate. And I thank David Stewart and his colleagues on the Petitions Committee and their clerks for providing Parliament with, as Jackson Carlos says, a very welcome uh, opportunity again to consider um, these issues. Now, I have previously said that I fully support uh, a move to, soft opt -out, uh, to a soft opt-out organ donor register, and I support uh, such legislation being uh, brought forward as, as soon as possible. And that is a view that I have put to the Chamber before, and one which I have made known um, to the Petitions Committee during their consideration of, of the Evening Times petition, which was um, supported by more than uh, 10,000 Evening Times readers. And the campaign which the Evening Times has run has been something which I have been privileged um, to have a, had a degree of involvement in. And at this point, I just want to put on record my thanks to Anne McTaggart for taking up this issue, and I look forward to her uh, contribution to this debate. Because um, under the current system, um, we do have no guarantee that our judgment in life will be respected in death. Uh, Ninety per cent of Scots support organ donation, but as Rory Grant rightly said, fewer than half of us um, carry the donor card. And the Minister is quite right to say that only a tiny percentage of us will die in circumstances in which organ donation might be possible. But the ultimate decision is taken by family members in the most difficult of circumstances, and there is no requirement whatsoever that the views of the potential donor are actually respected by the current system. So I believe that a change from an opt-in to an opt-out register would uh, help to support families who are unsure of what they should do. I, I do know of families um, who have said no and have gone on to regret uh, the choice that they have made for their loved one. And a, a change to an opt-out uh, system would mean that those who wish to donate could have a greater degree of confidence that their wishes would be respected. And, you know, notwithstanding the, the, the views the Minister has expressed today uh, about the evidence, this is a, um, a, a position that, that is held by the British Heart Foundation, by Kidney Research, by the British Medical Association. It used to be um, the view of the, the Cabinet Secretary when he was in, in opposition that this could lead to um, a rise in the number of donations. And for me, that is the crux of this issue, because I believe it is a simple change that would save lives. And it is a change... Um, that's already been supported by almost half of all MSPs across the chamber, across uh, the parties, in terms of publicly giving their backing uh, to the Evening Times campaign. Uh, and that's before we even had any kind of detailed debate um, that might reassure uh, those who might have initial concerns. But, President Officer, this is a view that, uh, certainly in my case, I came to over, over time, and I came to understand it as, as others, particularly uh, my friend Richard Simpson, helped to bust the myths of so-called presumed uh, presumed consent. When the, whether, whether there is an opt-in uh, register or an opt-out register, the fundamental choice remains the same. It's a, it remains a choice for individuals. The choice to give remains something that we should celebrate and not take for granted. And I see nothing uh, in a change to an opt-out register which diminishes uh, any, of, any of that. There are hundreds of people waiting on organ waiting lists. The opportunity we have is, is, is not to remove the choice, but to make the choice as easy as possible. And this Parliament is you know, capable of being bold from time to time, and you know, my party's front bench have, have committed our support, but this does not need to be um, a political issue if the government is prepared um, to either bring forward a consultation itself or to, uh, uh, or if a, or to um, you know, a, a, the issue of a free vote works both, uh, works both ways. And if there is a member's bill, I hope um, the government would, would be extremely open to their backbenchers giving support to that member's bill, given the breadth of support um, that has actually been put on the public record. Um, on this. So I acknowledge that reassurances would be required, safeguards would be complex, new procedures would need to be detailed and a significant public information campaign uh, would be essential before uh, we could use any new register. But when I spoke in the, 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 this debate previously, that was in November 2012, and I said that if we agreed on that day to do this, then change would still be years off and in the meantime more people would die. And that's the reality of this. People have died in the time since we, since this, uh, the time during at uh, which this, position, uh, uh, this petition has been um, considered. Uh, and I absolutely recognise the progress that has been made, but I believe that without a clear timetable uh, for reform, more families will lose a loved one after months of waiting, of dashed hopes, knowing that a donor could be out there somewhere uh, who could help, who, who would be willing to help, but which the current system uh, makes it harder for that match to happen. The Welsh Government have already done this, so when I asked the Petitions Committee to take evidence from them, I did it because their experience in winning the public debate in, in Wales would be of great value in assisting Scotland uh, to do the same. But I see absolutely no need to await a review of the legislation uh, in Wales before we are uh, prepared to act. I, I thought coming in here that the Government's objection 
uh, was no longer in principle and it would simply be um, about timing. And I, I, I was concerned that, that that would be a delay um, that would cost lives. But I have to say, I'm disappointed by the, the, the comments from uh, the Minister about this uh, this afternoon. But, and I do think it, it, it represents um, a departure from some of the previous words that we've had from Alec Neil and indeed from Nicola Sturgeon. Many thanks. Now call on Bob Doris to be followed by Mary Scanlon. Uh, Presider officer, I have previously said that I was undecided on whether there should be an opt-out system of organ donation in Scotland. I suspect this matter may ultimately come before the Health and Sport Committee, where I sit as Deputy Convener. I was clear that I would have to scrutinise any legislation that may come before the committee, and that that was a distinct advantage, being undecided. In recent, in recent weeks, I have come to the growing realisation that this may actually just have been a way of avoiding coming to a, a personal position on, on opt-out and then advocating that within, within our Scottish Parliament. In the meantime, I have looked on in admiration at Caroline Wilson's petition on behalf of the Evening Times and Kidney Research UK in relation to an opt-out system. I also had an unnerving feeling that I might not have been doing all I can to help the constituents that, that I represent. However, what really impacted on me was a recent meeting I had with the Cystic Fibrosis Trust. They too support an opt-out system for, for organ donation. However, that was not the reason for my meeting with them. It was in relation to their calls for changes to the lung allocation scheme for transplants. They are seeking a new national system as opposed to a regional system of lung allocation for transplants. Indeed, I have corresponded with uh, various public bodies in relation to this matter, and there is actually clinical evidence in both sides of the debate, and I understand that is currently being reviewed. And I think that is important. There is strong evidence in both sides of the debate, and there is not a clear route forward in any of this. And as individuals, we have to balance up what is best for our constituents. But what really struck me about my meeting with the Cystic Fibrosis Trust was some other matters that they raised with me as part of a wider campaign that they have, and that does relate to organ donation. In particular, it was about the invidious choices that those living with cystic fibrosis have to make when desperately waiting for a transplant. For accuracy, let me quote directly from their briefing. They used the terminology extended criteria lungs. So what are extended criteria lungs? These are, and I quote, lungs which fall outside the traditional donor criteria set by the International Society for Heart and lung transplant. They may come from a donor who is over 55, have smoked or who have some mild lung abrasions. I should point out that these lungs are tested and cleaned before they are used. However, their science is not perfect. There is a small amount of examples where recipients, having had lungs from former smokers, have gone on to develop lung cancer and have died relatively shortly afterwards. What a, what a tragedy! Could you imagine the choice of a CF sufferer uh, of having to decide between no organs or such lungs? I, I couldn't imagine what, what I would choose if, if I was in that situation. Would I wait for that, that, those perfect lungs to come available, or would I take a punt on what I think was described as suboptimal organs earlier on in this debate? But that was the story that Yvonne, Yvonne Hughes of the Cystic Fibrosis Trust brought home, the reality for many who are waiting. For organs. So where does that leave me in relation to an opt-out system? Do I still have concerns with it? Absolutely I do, and the contradictions inside my head only get greater as this debate goes on, because I am just quoting back some of the figures here. So 93 per cent of people in Scotland say they want organs to be used, but 43 per cent of families refuse organs. Yet again, 62 per cent of organs that are used come from people who did not carry an organ donor card. And without an opt-out system in the last five or six years, we have doubled the amount of organs available for transplants. So no one in this chamber should say this is easy, this is simplistic, or this is straightforward. And it is most definitely not a party political issue with, with me. Uh, Christine Graham, before she made an intervention, spoke about I have not spoken to the, uh, to the whips on this. Why would you? We say what we like on this matter in this parliament. And that's what I'm doing. There's no need to speak to anyone other than to look at the facts and the evidence yourself. And what this debate's enabled me to do is to look seriously at this. So do I, should I come to a, a position now on, on opt-out? Well, I'm still not quite there yet. Um, but I have to say, 
I would have to find some strong, compelling reasons not to have an opt-out system in the years ahead and hopefully in the not too distant future. Uh, I think that's really important for myself and I think it is really important that we do take this forward in this parliament on the basis of consensus. So you've not quite got me yet in terms of opt-out. I have a number of concerns that I don't have time to put on the record here this afternoon, but um, I'm left with the lasting impression that it's almost certainly the right thing to do. Actually, whether it makes a difference or not, because if only one life can be saved, surely it's worth moving to that opt-out system to save that life. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, thank you, Mr Doris. And I would just say to the Chamber that given slightly changed and indeed changing circumstances, I can now allow speeches of between five and six minutes. I call Mary Scanlon to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm very pleased to speak in this debate in the absence of my colleague, Dr Nanette Milne. Uh, in the debate secured by George Fawkes in January 2008, I stated that I did not support the concept of presumed consent, which in my view is a contradiction in terms. Presumed consent does not consent on the basis that consent means agreeing or giving assent. This can only be freely given by an individual, and I strongly feel that donation of organs should be willingly given and not willingly taken, and that organ donation is a matter of individual conscience and individual freedom and not a matter for the state. Uh, in that debate, I also used a quote given by a consultant at Addenbrooke's Hospital who said, and I state, if as a doctor you have turned your thoughts to your patient being a donor when they are still living, that is a real conflict. And that was six years ago, and I have to say I still hold these views. Uh, however, I have carefully read the evidence to the Public Petitions Committee from Mark Drayford, Minister for Health and Social Services in the Welsh Government, uh, and I would like to commend the members not only of the Petitions Committee, but also the Welsh Assembly, in fact across the political divide in that uh, Assembly, on the excellent consultation and work that they have done in moving to a so soft opt-out system for organ donation. And like others, I am not saying that I will vote for this system if we are presented with this opportunity, but I certainly find many aspects of the soft opt-out system much more acceptable than the previous proposal of presumed consent. I would put on the record that I have no problem agreeing with the motion in front of us uh, today. Uh, I like the idea that people can continue to opt in and put their names on the organ donor register, also that they can opt out or indeed they can choose to do nothing. And as others have said, it is commendable in Scotland. We have the highest percentage of population registered, uh, registered for the organ donor uh, register, which is currently 10% above the UK average. Uh, and I think it's also worth putting on record that we should commend the fact that the number of people donating their organs after death increased by 50% between 2007-08 and 2012-13, and also the significant increase in transplants. And that really coincides with the previous debate that we had in this Parliament. However, there's no doubt uh, that more needs to be done, uh, given the transplant uh, UK transplant waiting list of over 7,000. It's also a concern that 43% of families refuse to allow donation to go ahead, uh, sometimes even overturning the recorded wishes of their loved ones. Uh, and for all these reasons, although I'm not signed up to the soft opt-out system, but I do think it is worthy of consideration. And there are also further issues to be worked through uh, from the Petitions Committee evidence. Uh, and one that really struck me, I think it was Chick Brodie and Jackson Carlos' uh, questions at the committee, uh, was the changing structure of many families. So if someone has not opted out, there may not have been a discussion within the family of their commitment to donate organs. And secondly, if members of the family disagree 
about their understanding of the person's wishes, wishes, that could also be an issue. And I appreciate that a person can be appointed to represent the views uh, of the person, and this is very helpful, but many people may not exercise this option. And I have to say, it's certainly not something that I've ever discussed within my family, I have to admit that. At the Petitions Committee, Jackson Carlow rightly asked the question of who would arbitrate in the event of a person doing nothing at the point of donation. Who makes the ultimate decision for the transplant to proceed and also for confirmation that the family's view would prevail? The primacy of the appointed representative is very helpful and there's no doubt that considerable awareness raising and publicity is needed prior to any consideration of moving to this new system. So, presiding officer, and uh, well, I would just maybe add that I've maybe got a slightly longer. Uh, I found the BMA briefing very helpful. Um, I wouldn't say I totally agree with them, but I thought the point they made about statutory guidance being needed surrounding any new legislation to provide clear guidance to professionals on how to deal with relatives' refusals. I, is, is that has to be a very difficult thing, particularly what would be likely to cause distress to bereaved relatives and this process being carried out on an individual basis by trained professionals. So the soft opt-out system sounds good, but it's not without some unintended uh, consequences and challenges. So in summing up my contribution to this debate, I found presumed consent wholly unacceptable. I think the soft opt-out system does address some of the concerns relating to presumed consent, and I would certainly welcome the input of a named representative and families. I'm afraid I'm you must close now. delighted that much progress has been made, and like Jackson Carlow, I'm keen to follow the outcomes of the so soft opt-out system in Wales, and I acknowledge my party's free vote on this issue. Thank you very much. I call Christine Graham to be followed by Jim Hume. Five and a half minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. The point I was making, I think, to my colleague Bob Doris is that this should inevitably and must be a free vote across uh, all of the parties in this Parliament. And I want to congratulate the petitioner on bringing this forward. And I've spoken in previous debates on this issue and say that I fully support obtaining an increase in organ donation through the opt-in system. I've opted in myself. It's easy to do. You just go online click a button and you're in the opt-in register. I also support an opt-out register, but I'll refer to that later. But I want to tackle some of the definitions used in this debate. We're talking of donation. Now, if you're donating, this is willingly given. If you're a blood donor, you willingly give it. If, and I'll move on to whether it's deemed or presumed consent, there's silence, there cannot be donation. There cannot be a refusal to donate. There cannot be a willingness to donate. You don't know, but there's certainly not donation. And when I challenged uh, David Stewart about consent, where it's deemed consent, presumed consent, it's sophistry to say there's a difference between deemed consent and presumed consent. And that is a contradiction in terms. Because consent must be clearly and freely given and informed. And the individual must have capacity. Now, if you have silence, you cannot achieve any of those elements whatsoever. And mistakes could be made, I think, referred to earlier in the debate. So I've got problems with the word donation and deemed consent. I don't have problems with two registers. And being on these registers shouldn't be mandatory on any family who are members there. They should be persuasive to family members of the wishes of the person when they had capacity and they gave consent or they withheld that consent being on either of these registers because they've expressed their views clearly. And I'm going to pray in aid of this. A quotation I prayed in aid in 2008, if I may just go and I'll let you in, if I've got a little bit of time, it's an important quotation, because this is the words of a senior consultant surgeon at the Western Infirmary who 
was there when traumatic uh, uh, people came in and, and the have brain st stem dead was uh, uh, imminent. This is what he said. It's unthinkable that a dead patient's organs would be taken without family agreement and hence discussion with the deceased family after a brain stem death will need to continue as before, whether we have the two registers. It is vital that this discussion is informed by accurate knowledge of the patient's wishes expressed before death. This can only be guaranteed by a registration of patient's wishes whether for or against donation. In fairness to Rhoda, I want to just finish this point. Anything less than this form of balanced registration, we, it would be invalid as an indicator of the deceased's wishes and could not reasonably be used to inform the discussion with the deceased family, which will need to take place even with a change in the law to presumed consent. Now, my problem isn't with the two registers. My problem is that bit in the middle, this deemed or presumed consent. I think you have to tread very, very carefully there. I think it's absolutely right that we have an opt-out register. I think it's right we have an opt-in register. That makes the surgeon's job so much easier in discussing it with the family, even as they do now. But to have a surgeon have to say to somebody, I don't have your dead son or your dying son or daughter on either register. They're not on the opt-out register and they're not on the opt-in register, but the law tells me I can deem consent. I think that makes that surgeon's job tougher. I think it makes the conversation tougher. I think we should leave that to the discretion that is exercised just now by surgeons, but by having the two other registers, you clearly have a better chance of persuading the family and certainly the family having some guidance, which Final is much minute. needed in that circumstance. Now, Rhoda, I think I've got a minute. If you want, I'm happy. I've just got, have I finished? You have to finish by five and a half minutes. Would you want to come in now, Rhoda? And say Rhoda Grant, so please use full names. Rhoda Grant. Um, thank you for, to allow, for allowing the intervention. The current system allows families to make a decision on behalf of someone with no knowledge of whether or not they wish to consent or not. The, a soft out system would allow people to either register their consent or their wish not to donate um, and would remove that onus from families. So currently, are you saying that the 63% of donations made where nobody's on the register shouldn't be made now? But I'm saying Graham, you must draw to very conclusion. quickly, if you change the law when silence becomes something other than silence, becomes a deemed or presumed consent, you make that more difficult for the surgeon who has to inform the dying person's parents that that's the position in law. Two registers are a good idea, but not a presumption on silence. Thank you very much. I now call Jim Hume to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Speeches of five and a half minutes maximum, please. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. This is a debate of utmost importance. It's a matter of literally life and death. I think it's appropriate we de debate it uh, here today as a national conversation on organ donation has not been held since the Human Tissue Act in 2006. I believe that Scotland needs to have an open and robust debate on this tricky issue of death because as society we too often postpone dealing with the difficult topics of palliative care and in this case organ donation until it's too late. I'd like to begin by praising the work of the Public Petitions Committee for considering Caroline Wilson's petition for taking evidence from the key stakeholders and praise should be reserved of course for Caroline and the rest of the Evening Times team for leading an effective campaign which garnered over 18,000 signatures in support ensuring that organ donation continues to occupy our thoughts. In their evidence submission to the Public Petitions Committee, the BMA said, a culture in which donation is discussed more openly and perceived as the norm would fit better, better with what most people claim to support. So the key, key question really is, how do we arrive at a point where donation is the norm? Currently, there are 7,500 people waiting for an organ transplant in the UK about six of those, 600 of those in Scotland. There are three people each day dying while on the transplant list waiting for an organ. But the reality, reality is that many whose life would benefit and be enhanced with a new organ will die each year before making it onto that waiting list. 
So the demand for organs in Scotland is greater than what statistics such as these do tell us. I think we should acknowledge that progress has been made by the, this government. The Organ Donation Task Force report six years ago has helped to oversee a 74% increase in donations, with 40% of Scots now on the organ donor register. I believe transi transitioning towards a soft opt-out system will help close the deficit between the 50% of Scots who are registered donors and the 90% of Scots who support organ donation. I believe that this system means to include the, that lost 40% of people who support organ donation but who, for various reasons, fail to become registered donors. Surveys have consistently shown that support for this system is in excess of 70% of the population, and countries that operate this model, model have uh, roughly 25% higher donation rates than informed consent countries. The, uh, there are those NHS boards which are reluctant to endorse the soft out, opt out system, NHS Tayside, uh, for one. They are not alone highlighting their concerns that any assumption or presumption of patients' wishes would be detrimental to the doctor-patient relationship, and this could result in a reduction in levels of consent and authorisation. Clearly, we would all wish to avoid any measure which would lead to an erosion in trust by doctors uh, by patients. But I doubt this would be the case. And the Voice of Scotland Doctors, the BMA, is one of the most vocal advocates in favour of the soft opt-out. They seem satisfied this will not be a problem, and therefore so am I. In preparation for this debate, I reviewed some of the evidence received by the committee from stakeholders and the contribution from NHS Fife uh, concerned me. In it, Dr Brian Montgomery explained that fear of failure by transplanting units across the UK is leading to too many healthy organs not being transplanted within, uh, with several in uh, instances where such organs are subsequently successfully transplanted into European recipients. So I wonder if today the Minister can address Dr Montgomery's point and investigate whether, whether this is common in Scotland and, if it is, try and ensure that healthy organs are not failing to be utilised. Similarly, we must tackle the practice of registered donors not having their organs utilised following the refusal to give consent by relatives. I understand that NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde this is as great as, as 15% of donors. This relates to our society's reluctance to have the difficult conversations that need to take place. So we must encourage people to have these conversations, and I would like to see this Scottish Government taking the lead in ensuring this happens. The Government's recent donation and transplantation plan recommended a full public consultation on approaches to, increase, uh, to increasing organ donation in Scotland. I welcome this. What I did not welcome was the failure to mention a soft opt-out as a potential measure in its talking points. Instead, referring to paying for the funerals of donors or giving priority to those on waiting lists who are registered donors. A soft opt-out, I believe, must be included in any consultation to allow the public to have their say. I believe that with the proper safeguards and procedures in place, the vast majority of people would be satisfied with the soft opt-out model in Scotland. This is an effective means to drive up the number of donated organs being available to help save the lives of those people dying before they receive an organ or even a place on that waiting list. This has been demonstrated as working overseas and I'm confident it could work here too. Thank you very much. I call Anne McTaggart to be followed by John Wilson. Yes, that was me. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Public Petitions Committee, I also would like to thank Kidney Research UK and Caroline Wilson, who is in the gallery of the Evening Times, for their tireless work in bringing this vitally important issue to the attention of the Scottish Parliament. Through the evidence presented to the committee by a wide range of individuals and organisations, I have been convinced that the introduction of a soft opt-out system of organ donation would be in the best interest of patients and would ultimately save lives. Presiding officer, we know that most people in Scotland support the opt-out system of organ donation, yet the majority of the population have not yet chosen to register as an organ donor. A survey un un undertaken by, in early 2012 by the Scottish Government demonstrated that only 5% of the population oppose organ donation in principle. 
And yet, the United Kingdom continues to have one of the lowest organ donation rates in Europe. Enabling and encouraging those who support the transplantation of their organs after death to sign up to the register is a key priority. But I now believe that this is no longer enough when it comes to saving precious lives. In order to truly tackle the crippling shortage of organs in Scotland, we must adopt the Welsh model of soft, soft opt-out system of organ donation. This will dramatically increase the number of organs available to the termina terminally ill, whilst allowing those who do not wish to donate the opportunity to remove their name from the register. Evidence presented to the committee by the Welsh Government highlighted some of the key reasons that the Welsh Assembly chose to pass the Human Transplantation Wales Act in 2013. This legislation will come into force in December 2015 and it is expected that the move to an opt-out system will result in 15 more organs donors every year in Wales, donating an average of three or organs each. This will result in as many as 45 lives being saved every 12 months as a direct result of changing the way that people can become donors. Presiding officer, under an opt-out system, individuals have exactly the same choice as an opt-in system to donate or not to donate. This proposal does not compromise the freedoms of an individual who objects to organ donation and wants to make their views known. In reality, this proposal would make it easier for those who do object to becoming organ donors to make their wishes clear. In an opt-out system, those who do not wish to be organ donors have the opportunity to make a positive declaration that they are opposed to transplantation of their organs. Just two wee seconds, and this is a decision that cannot be overturned by medical professionals after death. Yes, I'll take Christine Graham. Graham. As you're aware, I agree with an opt-in and an opt-out register, but what about the silent people in the middle? What's your view about what should be done there? I make target. We are not proposing um, to, to remove anybody's right that within the soft opt-out system, there is the right to either opt in or opt out. There is no silence. The family will still be consulted. There will be guidance and support throughout. If we can, presiding officer, if we can achieve reform, it is my ambition that organ donation will become the default position which, with public support, will change cultural expectations in society. This represents a more positive view of becoming an organ donor, which should be encouraged in order to increase the number of people in Scotland who owe their lives to the incredible gift of organ donation. Following from the evidence presented to me by a wide range of organisations and individuals, I am delighted to announce my intentions to bring forward a Member's Bill on this important subject. Building on from the excellent work carried out by my colleague Drew Smith, MSP, I intend to launch a consultation in the next coming weeks, which will gather responses from interested parties on reform of organ donation system in Scotland. I am hopeful that launching a Member's Bill on this subject will provide this Parliament with another opportunity to look at the compelling evidence in support of change and to scrutinise the powerful submissions made by the medical professionals, the third sector organisations and transplant patients in support of this important reform. Presiding officer, I welcome further debate on this important issue and I look forward to introducing the Members' Bill over the next few weeks, hopefully weeks and not months, on the introduction of an opt-out opt -out system and I do aim to convince the Minister and my fellow colleagues I'm in the Chamber that a soft opt-out system is the way forward to changing the lives in Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. I'm afraid we now have to return to just over five minutes for the last two speakers. John Wilson to be followed by Margaret McCulloch. Presiding officer, thank you. Can I, I rise to, in this debate as a member of the Public Petitions Committee? And can I remind 
the members in this chamber what the motion before us actually says. Because there seems to be a debate about opt-in, opt-out, soft options and all the rest of it. The motion actually says that the Parliament notes petition PE 1453 by Caroline Wilson on behalf of the Evening Times and Kidney Research UK, Scotland, which calls for an opt-out system of organ donation in Scotland, congratulates the petitioner on her efforts to raise awareness of organ donation and commends the issues raised in the petition and the evidence received by the committee to the Scottish Government for further consideration. It doesn't talk, it, it mentions the issue about an opt-out system, but asks the Scottish Government to consider further. And based on the response from the Minister today, then quite clearly the Government are looking at the various options that are before us. And clearly the Minister outlined some concerns regarding the Spanish system and also the Welsh system. We have to be clear in terms of a debate of this nature that we actually consider all the issues around us and particularly the issues regarding what happens in other countries and what happens elsewhere. Because we've got to be aware that what we should be aiming to and striving to do is adopt the best system possible that takes this issue forward. And for many people, it is a very emotive issue. And I recall, and this is completely off my speech, but I recall a constituent approaching me at my surgery one day to ask me to sign off on her cons the consent form that she would donate her body to medical science. That constituent had to sit down when her family were together at Christmas to have that discussion with her family members or children to say that that was her express wishes that she wanted to donate her body to medical science. And I think it's been raised in this debate today already that many people find it difficult to talk to their, their family members, whether that be their parents or their children or whoever else within their family circle about what their express options would be in relation to their death and what would happen with their organs when they died. And the difficulty we have in this debate is that for many people, when they lose a loved one and are faced with the option of being asked whether or not these organs can be donated to help save someone else's life, in that moment, when they're being asked to make that decision, they are not in a mind to actually make those clear, thought-out decisions to actually make a, you know, an in informed choice. Because it is a very emotive time for many people when they have lost a loved one. And for someone in the medical profession, and we've, we have had evidence in terms of what happens in Wales, and ultimately, in terms of the system that exists in Wales at the present moment, it's the medical professionals that make the dec final decision. Relatives are consulted, but the medical profession makes the final decision on whether or not the organs are used for transplant. And the difficulty with that is we could potentially lose the trust that exists between families and the medical profession who are trying to do their job within the hospitals and elsewhere. And we have, to, we have to be very careful. If Richard Simpson wants to make an intervention, then go ahead, Richard. Richard Simpson, first names, uh, full names, Thank you please. very much. I, I've wrestled with this since my original report to the Health Committee back in the first parliament. The, 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 the critical thing is, the, the member is absolutely right, making a positive decision about your deceased relative at that point in time is incredibly difficult. But by changing the system to having a firm opt-out that you can register your right, you don't want to have the donation, makes that central silent portion that Christine Graham referred to much easier. Because the question changes from making a positive decision to actually ask them, do you see any reason? Do you know of any reason? Do you know of the deceased's wishes that they might not want their organs to be donated? John That's Wilson, you must draw to a conclusion, please. Your time is up. Th thank you, President Officer. And that issue, not everybody 
has the capacity at the present moment to opt out. And we have to be very, think very carefully what type of opt-out system we put in place to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to make that clear, distinct, informed choice. Thank you very much. Now call Margaret McCulloch. I'm afraid I can only give you five minutes. Thank you, President Officer. It's been six years since Organ Donation Task Force reported on ways to improve organ donation, and the progress that has been made in that time has been welcomed across the Parliament and across the medical profession, and quite right so. Their findings have shaped policy, informed the work of government and the Scottish Transplant Group, and contributed to an increase in donation rates which has exceeded expectations. As we have been hearing, many of the recommendations of the task force continue to be reflected in the new strategy on taking organ transplantation to 2020. But for all the progress that has been made in recent years, over 600 patients in Scotland are still waiting for a transplant. And the sad truth of the matter, as too many families out there know from their own tragic experiences, is that many of those people will die waiting. We have to ask ourselves, as a parliament and as a society, whether we're all doing all we possibly can. As the BMA put in their evidence of the Public Petitions Committee on this topic last year, now that we have a well-organised, well-funded, comprehensive infrastructure in place, is that enough? Can we say we have done all we can, or should we now look to go further and build on this progress by shifting our attention to new ways of increasing the number of donors and the number of lives saved. I believe that there is scope to do more, and I believe that there is merit in a soft-out option system of organ donation registration, like the system now used in Wales. And let me explain why. We know that there is widespread support across Scotland and across the UK for organ donation. Figures quoted in evidence to the committee put the figure at 90%. However, we still face a huge challenge in translating majority support for organ donation into better levels of donor registration. If organ donation is such a widely supported concept, then what is wrong with normalising the practice, a practice which can save lives? For us, a country which has already improved our infrastructure and our capacity to transplant organs, surely the next step is to look at new ways of increasing donation rates through legislative and cultural change. Surely the next step is to give serious consideration to the soft-out option. It's not just a matter of changing the law and moving towards a, a position of presumed consent. It's also about changing attitudes and creating a culture of openness and understanding in which we can more readily talk about what we want to happen to our bodies if the unthinkable should occur. Of course, there should be rigorous safeguards to make sure that liberty and choice is protected. Presumed consent doesn't mean doing away with the choice, and I don't accept that it cur curtails liberty. Choice must remain and safeguards would have to be put in place. Families should be consulted, even when their loved ones have failed to opt out to establish whether they are aware of any objections and whether proceeding with organ donation would cause them distress. And we would have to step up in ongoing campaigns to educate people about organ donation and encourage people to talk to their families about their wishes. Finally, President Officer, the University of York was commissioned by the Organ Donation Task Force to look at the experience of countries which applied the principle of presumed consent to donor registration. It found that while there were various factors which could be affecting donation rates, the opt-out system was associated with an increase. The task force decided in 2008 not to recommend a soft-out option, but it did suggest revisiting the issue at a later date. That time has now come. So let's take this opportunity today to put a soft option out back on the agenda. Let's take the next step to improve donation rates and ultimately save lives. And let's opt for something better and give this petition our time, our consideration and our support. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to closing speeches and I call on Jackson Carlaw. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by singling out the contribution of Bob Doris, who's sadly not in his place at the moment, uh, for the summation and attention he gave to the issues around cystic fibrosis, uh, which I did myself crystallise in a motion ten days ago, which I, to which I hope he'll lend his support. Uh, 
In my opening speech, I concentrated very much on the potential reputational damage issues, and I'd like in my summation to give voice to Mark Drakeford, the Welsh Minister, who responded to the concerns that I raised. So I am going to quote uh, from what he said. Those are really important points. The issue of reputational damage to the system were organ donation to go ahead in circumstances where the donor clearly did not wish it to happen, or vice versa, has preoccupied us during the process of the bill. I say to people who ask me in Wales that opting out will be absolutely as easy as opting in. It will not be made more difficult. We will make sure that anybody who wants to opt out can do so as easily as anybody who wants to opt in can do it. People will be able to opt out at general practitioner surgeries by visiting the internet site and so on. It will be very straightforward. The safeguard in our system comes through the role of the family. Donation cannot go ahead without the involvement of the family. And as you suggested, someone might have opted in on the register many years previously, but might subsequently have changed their mind and come to a different view. If the family knows and is able to tell the clinical team that, even though the individual is on the register as being in favour of organ donation, their views had changed and they would not wish to be a dono donor, the family's view would prevail. The safeguard comes through having the discussion at the point where a decision has to be made. We will not rely simply and solely on the register, even though we are confident that the register itself will be friendly to users and as accurate as it can be. And where people have, let me finish, and where people have no family, if they have appointed a representative, the donation will go ahead. But if somebody dies and no family member or representative can be found, the donation will not go ahead. We've had debate about that because somebody with no family members might have opted in and put their name in the register. But there are issues other than consent. For example, the clinical team will have to pursue with the family issues of medical history and whether the person is in a proper clinical condition to be a donor. From the clinical evidence, we know that those circumstances will be rare. But to protect the integrity of the system, our decision has been that if a person has no family and no representative, the donation will not proceed. And I want to say to Drew Smith, who I have very high regard for, and who I thought looked rather crushed, and I felt slightly affected by the sense of disappointment emanating at him from the position I articulated and the minister articulated, that I believe there is the prospect of the widest possible political consensus around this issue in the chamber. But I don't, I don't myself believe that it would be wise to push ahead when we have evolved what I think the Welsh have got right in the legislation that they are promoting without, and I don't think it is such a huge window, without giving that legislation the opportunity to prove itself, which I think it will do in very early course, because any of the difficulties that are contained within it, I think will materialise initially quite quickly, and that would give the opportunity for any legislation that subsequently came forward in Scotland the chance to reflect that. And it seems to me... Yes, I will come to Nigel. Nigel Dodd. Forgive me, forgive me interrupting, but I, I wanted to address the issue that Jackson Cole addressed be immediately beforehand, which is surely to suggest that one of the things that we should be encouraging, and I recognise there's other parts of this debate, is actually that members of the public have the card in their pocket, so that if they do get run over by a bus, there is actually no dispute about it. And if we could get, encourage people, one, to sign up, and two, to carry it, much of the, that debate Carlo. would go away. I think I would say to Mr Don, we have been pursuing that course, and Scotland more successfully than any other of the nations within the United Kingdom. And I, I think it's a remarkable tribute that we're at that point. But I accept that there may be, out of all of this, the opportunity for far more lives to be saved. I just... I just wish to make an appeal because the sense of this coming to me this afternoon is something that has left me quite deeply troubled, that any progression of this issue should enjoy the widest possible political consensus in this parliament. I think that political consensus can be achieved. There are members, Mary Scanlon and others, who are not yet quite there, and I think it would be wrong to push us there on such an important issue when we could actually all get there without being moved to a point where we end up in a political confrontation over something so terribly important, because I think that would fundamentally undermine public confidence. Drew Smith. I'm grateful to, to Jackson Carlo, but then would you not agree with me that what I certainly would have hoped to come out of this debate would be for the Scottish Government to indicate a level of consideration and consultation on this issue that goes, uh, that's, that, that goes better than saying that we'll wait to see what 
another country does uh, b before we before before we put the case for Jackson change. Carl, the Scottish Scottish Carl, you're in your final minutes. Yeah. I, I think that's a slightly ungenerous characterisation of what the minister was was suggesting, and, and I found myself very much in agreement with him on all of this. Uh, we, December the first, 2015. In all practical senses, I think uh, we will have an opportunity early in the next Parliament to have had an assessment of what the implications of that legislation in Wales have been. And if they have proved to have made a significant advance, then it can come to this Parliament. I say again, Conservatives will have a free vote in the issue whenever it does come before the Parliament. But I am one of those who is moved to support it, but wants to support it knowing that we will carry public confidence with us and confidence that the public will see this Parliament united in that move, because I do believe that if it were not, that could have a profound effect on the reputation of organ donation in Scotland. And that, I think, would be the last thing any of us would wish to see. Many thanks. I now call on Neil Findlay. Maximum six minutes, please. Thanks, President Officer. <coughs> this has been a, a very welcome and important debate and indeed the uh, petition. Uh, it's the type of issue that this Parliament, I think, has the duty to discuss, uh, consider and come forward with recommendations for improvement or change. Because this gets right to the heart of one of the most important issues of all, and that is the ability of politics and politicians to take decisions not only to change lives, but as Jim Hume said, to help sustain and extend life itself. That is what is at stake here. It couldn't be uh, more important. We've heard that uh, from Rhoda Grant and uh, Angus MacDonald that around 600 people in Scotland are waiting for some form of organ donation. 600 people are, uh, affected by debilitating conditions. 600 families whose lives are on hold waiting for the phone to ring, but for too many of them, unfortunately, the phone never does. Uh, yet we have the power to do something about that if we have the political will to act. Uh, President Officer Organ and other forms of transplantation have always been at the cutting edge of uh, medical innovation and development. We've witnessed some of the most astonishing advances in medical science from the very first skin grafts in the 19th century through to recent years where unbelievably we see whole face transplantation for a non-scientist and non-medic. These uh, uh, things to me are medical miracles that have changed and sustained the lives of heart patients, kidney patients, lung disease sufferers and liver patients throughout the world. Yet how many more people could we help if we had a better system that allowed more uh, organs to be donated? and transplanted, a system that allows those to opt out, not opt in, a system that could provide many more donors and donations. I, I listened carefully to uh, the Conservative uh, uh, representatives today, in particular Jackson Carlow appealing for this not to be political. And while he wasn't party political, he was indeed very ideological in his uh, objections uh, that he raised raising the sort of spectre of the state against the freedom of the individual is one of his great concerns. I think we can uh, dispel that as we debate this further. Uh, now, I, for one, uh, would never say that this is a simple issue, but other countries successfully operate such a system, and I believe so could and should we. But, of course, it would have to be done with the buy-in from the general public. They are the future donors. We need them to support this move. We need them to be full and active partners in any new system. But it can be done. A major public education programme could change things, could be highly effective. And as, uh, as Dave Stewart and Margaret McCulloch mentioned, we can put in place safeguards and options for people who have concerns. The current system sees a third of people register, and of course some people have their very own particular and often very personal reasons for not registering. But for many people, it's simply something that they've just never got round to. Uh, I probably suspect a number of us are in that category. An opt-out system could, I believe, change things dramatically, providing many more life-saving and life-changing organs for donation, but also raising the debate and breaking down some of the taboos about death and end-of-life care. Certainly, Mr. Bob Doris. Mr. Doris, thank you. 
but, but I agree with some of the people not getting round to registering. Uh, but in the opt-out system, that would be the exact same principle would, would be there. And it's certain communities that are less likely to say register to vote or vote that would also be followed out. They'd be least likely to opt out as well. And that would change the culture of campaigns. There'd have to be a public information campaign encouraging people to opt out if they wish. And that would be a very different dynamic we'd have to grapple with. Neil Finlay. Could I say absolutely? Absolutely. These are the challenges that we face in this, and if we're serious about it, then they're the challenges we should face up to. Um, it would also, I think, be good for the NHS, raising awareness of health issues, improving training for staff, and in the long run, saving much-needed resources. But most of all, most of all, it would provide extra years of quality of life for those people affected. We see that in countries that have adopted the soft opt-out system, the number of organs available has increased. In Norway, uh, the, the, the system provides a high level of donation, but in neighbouring countries with mandated systems, significantly lower figures emerge. Now, except, as the British Heart Foundation say, that there are other issues at play, the level and quality of infrastructure supporting any system, some social norms and practices, and some religious interpretations. And can I say, I absolutely respect the concerns of uh, Jackson Carlaw from the Minister and others, but like Drew Smith, I think many of these concerns can be over, uh, overcome. 30 and of seconds course, left. Several mentioned the Welsh system, um, a, a, a Welsh Assembly leading on this matter. Um, they have had that informed public debate and have secured public support. Finally, President Officer, for people in need of uh, transplantation, uh, life is very tough, but the thought of healthy, life-changing organs not being available can only further exacerbate their feelings of desperation. This Parliament has the chance to change and extend lives. It is my judgment that there would be a majority in this Parliament for such change. I look forward to Anne McTaggart bringing forward her Members' Bill on this. This is a difficult and a very emotive issue, but that is what we are elected to this Parliament to debate uh, and, we should, and, and to take decisions over. I think we should do the job that we are elected to do. Thank you. Now calling Michael Matheson, Minister. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I have, uh, of course, listened to uh, the views from across the Chamber with uh, of real interest to this afternoon because it is an issue which I recognise is very emotive and uh, uh, carries a wide range of uh, differing views. However, can I, do, can I say that I do want to strike a note of caution in this matter? I think um, there is a danger that this matter could start to become politically polarised in the way in which some of these issues are being presented. And I think it is got to be recognised that there are views right across this chamber uh, for and against uh, opt-out, soft opt-out, uh, opt-in, whichever mechanism uh, you wish to uh, bring forward. But I think it's important that we all uh, stick together in terms of the shared agenda of looking to increase organ donations in Scotland and finding the best way in which we can go about uh, trying to achieve that. And the approach that we've taken over the last five years has reaped very significant improvement, better than any other part of the UK, and that should not be forgotten. And the approach that we are taking to date is in order to build on that progress yet further. And it is on that point I want to say to both Rhoda Grant and also to Drew Smith, there has been no change in the Scottish Government's position in this matter. Nicola Sturgeon has previously given her own personal view in this matter. Her view remains the same, as is the Cabinet Secretary for Health now. His personal view remains the same. However, the Scottish Government has said previously that it was not persuaded, and the position we have taken now is that we remain we are not persuaded as yet, and we want to see how things progress in Wales before coming to a decision on the matter. But alongside that, it is not a case of waiting to see what happens in Wales and doing nothing. It is about doing all of the work we have set out in our strategy to continue to build on the progress, the excellent progress that has been made over the last five years. And I hope that all members would get behind that work in order to try and make sure that we build on the progress that has been made. Now, the approach that we have taken in the Scottish Government is based upon the expert opinion that has been put to the Scottish Government on what we should do in order to increase organ donations. And I was struck by some of the expert opinion that was given to the committee on this particular issue, in particular Dr Stephen Cole, that Jim Hume re made reference to in the Tayside uh, contribution, an intensive care consultant and a, a doctor with a great deal 
of experience in supporting organ donors and their families. And until recently, Dr Cole was also the regional uh, clinical lead for organ donations for Scotland. And he's also been a long-standing member of the Scottish Transplant Group and the, the Scottish Donations uh, Ethics uh, Committee. So he's an individual who does have a lot of, tr of experience in Scotland in this particular field. And in his committee, and I want to quote him, he says, the views of most professionals who are closely involved in organ donation and transplantation process is that an opt-out system would not convey an additional advantages, and additional advantages over and above those that are already seen with the current initiatives. In particular, the view of most professionals involved in intensive care, where the vast majority of potential organ donors are located, is that any assumption or presumption of patients' wishes could be detrimental to the doctor-patient relationship. This could actually result in a reduction in the level of consents and authorisations. Now, that's his view, and it's his view in the matter from the professional group that he is involved in. We can't ignore that type of view, and it's important we recognise it. Additionally, the submission that was also brought forward by the British Transplant uh, Society. Again, I want to quote them. Again, they represent those who work in the transplant field. The Society has previously voted on this issue of opt-out legislation and no clear consensus was reached. Concern was expressed by some who voted regarding the effects of such legislation. I want to finish the point I'm making. And it then went on to say opt-out legislation has been laid before the Welsh, laid before the Welsh Government it would seem unnecessarily hasty to follow the same route elsewhere in the UK until the results of the Welsh approach is known, and both, in, both in terms of the changes in organ donor numbers and also the costs involved. So I think the reasonable approach that we should take is to see how things progress in Wales in order to see what further measures should be taken here in Scotland. And I want to reiterate, I want to, no, I've got too much to say, uh, I want to reiterate the points that I uh, want to uh, make in this particular issue, and that is that over the last six years, there has been a 96% increase in donations, a 63% increase in transplants, and a 25% decrease in the transplant waiting list. And a large part of that is because of the work we've taken forward, particularly the infrastructure work that's made a significant difference in increasing the number of donors that we uh, receive in Scotland. And it's important Final that we minute. build on that in order to maximise the benefit that can come from that. And that's why, as a government, we have said at this particular point we are not persuaded, but we are monitoring and reviewing what's happening in Wales and we'll watch it with close interest. And once we've been able to evaluate the progress that's been made in Wales, we'll be able to come to a considered view on whether opt-out will actually add to the significant improvement that we've already achieved here in Scotland. Thank you very much. And I now call on Chick Brodie to respond to the debate on behalf of the Public Petitions Committee. Mr Brodie, you have until five o'clock. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as Vice Convener of the Petitions Committee, I'm delighted to support the motion uh, laid in our convener's name before the Chamber today. Uh, I think the tone uh, and the manner of the debate has mirrored the emotion and the uh, nature of the issue that will be discussed. But I would, uh, like John Wilson, draw everyone's attention to we're not discussing whether we're going to implement a, a opt-out um, donation today, but we are recognising that the, uh, the, the petition took us a bit further forward. Uh, and I have to, uh, in, in, in opening, recognise some telling speeches from Drew Smith, and Mary Scanlon, uh, and Bob Doris uh, particularly. Now, upon appointment to the committee, uh, presiding officer, it was suggested to me that the, uh, that it's the, the committee's agenda might be painstaking, difficult, and slow. Nothing could be further from the truth. And it is a tribute to the convener, to my fellow committee members, and the clerks that it has, in my experience, proved to be so much otherwise. It is also a tribute to all of our petitioners who have sought action from their parliament, their parliament on issues from flooding to registration of interests of the judiciary to speed cameras and to several and many key medical issues uh, like chronic pain, issues of thyroidism uh, and so on. Uh, and of course to the very uh, important critical in inquiry on child sexual exploitation. But none perhaps has uh, touched the personal psyche, as I'm sure the 
uh, assisted suicide bill when it comes before us. Uh, nothing like that has, uh, has touched the personal psyche as much as this particular petition uh, calling for consideration for an opt-out system of organ donation in Scotland. And I pay particular tribute and recognition to Carlin Wilson on behalf of the Evening Times and to Kidney Research uh, Scotland. This is a brave petition because it confronts the demands of, of donation and challenges the emotional approach that we will confront in the, 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 the ultimate debate, the approach by individuals and families alike that most people would prefer not to encounter on this very important issue. It also, I believe, brings our society uh, uh, and this parliament to a crossroads which does not negate the road already travelled and currently still being travelled on organ donation. But ask the parliament ask the Parliament perhaps to consider a new or alternative route, albeit one with hurdles yet to be overcome, such as presumed content, and I'll come to that later, uh, uh, consent uh, and its definition. Presenting after the choice before us, the committee was to consider, as the motion does, proceeding with the petition which called for a change from an opt-in mechanism for organ donation where an individual expressly states a wish that their organs and tissues be donated by joining the organ donor register to an opt-out system that assumes that organs and tissues are available for transplant unless, unless there are specific instructions uh, to the contrary. The emotion, the distress uh, enters the debate and will enter the debate whether there be a soft opt-in opt or soft opt-out where families of the deceased can either object uh, uh, or, in the case of, in the case of opt-out, determine the pr to proceed or not after consultation uh, with the appropriate authority. The hard options, of course, are very, very clear. What cannot be denied, uh, presiding officer, is that whichever route is chosen, organ donation, as has been pointed out by Mark Drakeford and Jackson Carl in a very powerful uh, uh, contribution, uh, stressed that uh, when we took witness from him and we all know that Wales now is currently proposing to move to a soft opt-out uh, uh, which is also being promoted by the BMA. He said succinctly, organ donation saves lives. And as David Stewart in the opening indicated that 35 people uh, in Wales died last year while on the organ donor waiting list. And that was one but one uh, reasonable assertion for the serious consideration of this petition and its progress. So organ, organ donation saves lives and the committee recommendation to the government, indeed the Scottish Government's further proposals, uh, will await the evaluation of the impact of the Welsh uh, legislation. While we wait that, again I applaud the Evening Times, as I do the National Health Service Greater Glasgow and Clyde in their Respect My Dying Wish uh, campaigns for bringing and keeping the organ donation issue at the forefront of our minds. That said, Presiding Officer, we cannot deny that the recent past proposals by the Organ Donation Task Force and the recommendation contained in the Donation and Transplantation Plan for Scotland seem to be having an effect. Since January 2008, since the ODT's first report with its 14 recommendations on overcoming barriers to organ donation, organ donation with an outcome to increase organ donation by 50% over five years, Scotland has achieved 74% increase. The ODT in its second phase considered the measures that might be required in moving to a system of opting out, but introduced some caveats around risk, but it didn't, didn't rule it out. In setting the transplantation plan for Scotland for 2013 to 2020, presiding officer, the government set an expectation on Scotland being amongst the best performing countries in the world on organ donation. The high-level outcomes and priorities for action, uh, 21 of them in total, if implemented in full and if achieved, will secure that objective and that of the Scottish Transplant Group. 96% increase in donations, 62% increase in transplants, 25% uh, per, per increase uh, uh, in, in registering. Over the last six years, that has actually happened. And it suggests that the plan uh, may be working, but that the, that trend will depend on achieving priorities like funding and delivering high-profile organ donation awareness 
so that the public in Scotland is informed, informed and engaged in the organ donation and transplantation issue, and that the petition and the debate today it will certainly uh, add to that. But above all, I believe, presiding officer, it's incumbent in the existing framework or indeed in a proposed soft opt-out system, it's incumbent to ensure all parts of the NHS in Scotland and the general public are supportive of donation and transplantation. And the Scottish Government really should publish an annual report card on, four, on the four or five key national measures on organ, organ donation, whether we have soft opt-in or soft opt-out. And when the government comes to review progress, we must consider all aspects of, the, of that progress. That if we go down the route of opt-out, uh, then we must measure that success or otherwise of the Welsh programme and what success that brings. Presiding officer, I mentioned at the beginning of my contribution, of my contribution the emotional impact associated with the soft opt-out option. And I have no doubt that that will be a consideration when we come to the actual debate itself. In all of that, presiding officer, in this sensitive area, consultation, education and engagement are essential so that the government can be if the government is to be persuaded to follow the Welsh route. There can be no doubt that the Scottish Government remains very committed to organ donation in whatever process we follow that. I also believe, presiding officer, on this sensitive subject, on which of course people will have their own personal views, we of course must take advice not just from experts, but from those families who might have, might or have been affected. Presiding officer, I like to think of the petitions committee as the prodding committee, and today I, and I'm sure the rest of the committee, applaud the petitioner, uh, Caroline and the Evening Times and Kidney Research for prodding us on this very, very important issue. Thank you, Mr Brodie. That concludes the Public Petitions Committee debate on petition number 1453, Organ Donation in Scotland. Point for the Mary Fee. Presiding officer, at First Minister's questions today, the First Minister, in answer to questions from Joanne Lamont, said, and I quote, none of the opposition parties in this parliament have expressed any concern in public that I can find. He then added, I think it is reasonable to find out whether the Labour Party in this parliament has any similar record of action or concern. Presiding officer, that is wrong. These statements are incorrect and the official record needs to be corrected by the First Minister this afternoon. On the 30th of July 2013, I tabled motion S4M 07362, which condemned the anti-gay legislation passed under Vladimir Putin. I quote, put pressure on President Putin and Russia's leaders to, to overturn the country's anti-gay laws. That motion received support from SNP MSPs. On the 6th of February, I tabled motion S4M 08982, which condemned the openly homophobic attacks against gay men in Russia, as revealed in the Channel 4 Hunted programme. That motion received cross-party support. On 13 February, my colleague Drew Smith wrote to the Minister for External Affairs regarding the Sochi Olympics and raised concerns regarding the rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people in Russia. Presiding officer, the First Minister said that Labour members had not raised human rights violations in Russia. He stated we had expressed no concerns about the Putin regime. He was wrong. As laid out in the guidance on the correction of inaccuracies of information provided in parliamentary proceedings, members, including ministers, have a personal responsibility to be accurate and truthful in their contributions during part of parliamentary proceedings. And under paragraph five of that guidance, the First Minister is under an obligation to correct the record. The First Minister needs to take this opportunity to apologise for giving the very wrong impression that my party has not spoken out in this parliament about Vladimir Putin and his regime, which he is so keen to praise. Order.
I thank the member for the advance notice of the point that she's just made. Um, these are matters of debate. I have said repeatedly that the presiding officers are not responsible for the veracity of the contributions made by any members in this chamber. We now move to members' business. There is one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion number 9847, in the name of David Stewart, on petition number 1453, Organ Donation in Scotland, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time, and I now close this meeting.